ready or not 2019 movie review and thoughts. So I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I absolutely loved. This video will have some jokes and I will get into a number of serious topics. So I realize this video is long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I started this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoiler so you can mute and skip ahead and choose to see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. Now, the yeah, the movie is rated R, so is this video. There's a lot of strong language in this movie. I will probably both be quoting and adding strong language of my own for those bothered by that. So, the... Let's see. Yeah, this is one of those movies where you should know as little as possible, but I will try to spoil... I'm going to try to keep the, the review itself spoiler-free. So, the plot. A bride's wedding night takes a sinister turn when her in-laws insist they play a game. And, yeah, so the IMDb, more like this list, compares this to Happy Death Day, The Babysitter, which also stars Samara, or features, I, I haven't watched it, I'm not 100% sure if she is the star, but yeah. Samara Weaving is also in The Babysitter, The Invisible Man, the, the recent one, I believe. Happy Death Day to you, Don't Breathe, No Escape, You're Next, which I have heard a number of people compare, to The Cabin in the Woods, Us, It, and I think it's the new one, Fear Street Part 2 and Part 1. I notice I forgot to copy in, I'm just going to really quickly, the only one of them that I've watched is Cabin in the Woods, and I gave that movie a 8 out of 10. And on the... Um, Disney Plus, where I watched it, the suggested section uh, features uh, Bad Times at the El Royale, Murder on the Orient, uh, yeah, Orient Express, the new one, Black Swan, which I give a 10 out of 10, Courage Under Fire, Dark Waters, the Jennifer Connelly version, Flight Plan, which I give 5 out of 10, What Lies Beneath, and The Hills Have Eyes, the, the remake. And, yeah, uh, part of why I, I watched this and I'm doing this video is because Scream 6 is coming out, and it's still being done by the same... I'm, I'm really glad. I, I... As long as they have cool ideas for Scream, I want them to keep making Scream movies, and... Yeah. So, the... Uh, yes, the writing, this was written by Guy Busick and R. Christopher Murphy. Now, Guy Busick also, you know... Yeah, he wrote a movie called Urge in 2016, which I don't know. He, he wrote the story for it. He wrote both the 2022 Scream and Scream 6, which is coming out this year in a few months, I guess. Yeah, a couple of months. And R. Christopher Murphy has written various, including some TV. And I don't think I'm familiar with any of... Oh, he... Oh, no, he didn't write Wrong Turn. He was an assistant on Wrong Turn. Yeah, that movie's fine. You know, if you're going to watch it, uh, don't pay attention to the opening credits. And otherwise, yeah, it's, it's a decent watch. So, uh, yes, credit quote. It presents a fascinating setup with a childhood game... That turns dangerous, giving you, if you could thrill, start the humorous moments along the way. Um, oh, yeah, this person says, Unfortunately, Busick and Murphy's screenplay doesn't do quite enough with the premise. I don't know that I really agree with that. The film is a slight critique of marriage as an institution, too, which as a historical instrument has been used to transmit wealth and preserve fortunes. Marriage for Love throws a monkey wrench into this. The film offers a contrast between Grace, who marries for love, and Charity Le Domas, who married into the family for money, and who is into whatever preserves the advantages her marriage bought for her. Grace may have craved marriage. Alex asks her to marry him. Let's 
the because the alternative was her walking away, but she is not so obtuse about it that she doesn't get an education. And yeah, her illusions do not last. Yeah, I really love the writing here. I think they did a really good job of just every everything that the ah, what's the word? They really they they sat down and thought of okay, what can we do with the the concept that we we have here, and just yeah. I, I felt like there was a, a great variety throughout. I never felt like it was just spinning its wheels or just not... Uh, what's the word? They, they never... It never felt like they just didn't really have enough good ideas to fill feature length. Uh, right, and yeah, this is... Uh, actually, yes, I will... Yeah. So... Plot twists. I would say it handles them well. There are... Um, some people have said that they figured out some of the plot twists. I disagree that those were plot twists. There are certain things about this movie that you are not really supposed to, like, wonder about. Like, like it will set something up. And, you know, you'll you'll have to wait for the payoff to see exactly, but you have an idea. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think people today are way too obsessed with, ooh, does it have plot twists? Uh, can I guess the plot twists and such? That's really not the... Th this is more of the, the kind of... Yeah, you might be able to... It's, it's not about... A plot twist that really blows your mind although you know hopefully you don't realize exactly what's gonna happen in the you know the the core concept of the movie I'm trying to be coy and played very be, be very vague about it here but yeah you know once you once you realize what's going to happen it's not a plot twist heavy movie it's not really about that it's about watching the concept play out and I think that was the right choice. So, direction. This was directed by the Radio Silence duo Tyler Gillett and Matt Bettelini Alpin. And yeah, both of them have directed Scream 6 and Scream 2022. The uh, hold on. southbound segments, The Way In and The Way Out, Devils Do. Oh, hold on. Ah. Tyler Gillett, both of them have directed the two screen movies and this. And Tyler Gillett is also listed as having done the the Southbound segments, The Way In, The Way Out, Devils Do, and the VHS segment, 103198. And uh, Matt Bellini Olpin is also listed as directing uh, some shorts that I... I'm not familiar with, but yeah, they they do a really solid job. So I have been really happy with dark progressive films that are horror and or comedy of recent years. I've agreed with the messages and progressive movies and shows for many years. I think in recent years, you know, finally progressive filmmakers have stopped trying to just be like, okay, can you please have empathy? Because a lot of conservatives don't. They refuse to. It has been... They have been given the chance. So, no. It's, you know, subtlety's done. Here are some movies where just, you know, the, the, the evils that progressive fight against are really explored. Not, not this subtle... Yeah. So... Ranked worst to best other than this, and I love all of these other than Antlers, which I come close to loving. Antlers, Not Okay, The Menu, Barbarian, and Fresh. At the end of the review itself, I will update that ranking with this movie. So, let's see. Yeah, so some critic quotes. Ready or Not brings a new twist to the familiar story of trying to impress your soon-to-be in-laws by combining horror mystery and a little bit classic screwball comedy. Very true. Ready or Not blends horror and comedy effortlessly, effortlessly 
to give the audience a great viewing experience. A darkly hilarious new entry in the ever-expanding cinema of discontent inspired by the one percenters and Donald Trump. And I forget if I copied it in, but someone pointed out there were actually a lot of movies that were criticizing rich people in 2019. I hadn't really thought about it before I saw the, the list, but yeah. And let's see. Yeah, yeah, some feel the intrigue propels you more than the execution of the concept, but they do go on to say, but I think if you go see this one, a good time will be had by all. I think they did a great job with the execution. Witty with enough twists and shocks to keep it interesting, Ready or Not has the same class warfare that made Get Out and Parasite so oddly satisfying. And yet I found at least one review that claimed that there were no politics in this. Cavernacle is right. Conservatives are terrible at analyzing their favorite media. Like, it's okay. If you're a conservative and you love this movie, that's fine. You know, but it's absurd to say that this is not about class warfare. I, I saw there was at least one review where they were like, oh, it's just this one family. Okay, how would they possibly have convinced you that it's rich people in general if you don't think that this fam... Like, there are so many lines. Not not too many, but but there's a lot of little... Like, they'll... they'll God, the things these rich people whine about. And not only in this movie, but also in real life. You know, a lot of the things that the rich people will whine about in this movie are things that rich people whine about in real life, sometimes on camera, sometimes in front of the entire world, and they think that they're making a great case for why they should have everything and the rest of us should have nothing. It's just, it's insane. I, we, I'm really glad we're making movies like this. We really need movies like this. Push the fence centers into taking a position. You know, the rich people are all over TV making their case. You know, we're making ours with these movies. And let's see. What elevates this above other genre entries is its biting social commentary as it mercilessly skewers the 1% and the lengths they go to to attain and maintain their wealth. Let's see... A mad cap cat and mouse game that's exhilaratingly fun and offers a darkly funny and satirical take on just how ridiculous the rich really are. Not many movies can have you laughing at one minute and biting your nails at another, ready or not does. It is the perfect combination of horror and humor, a wild and fun ride. I gotta uh, agree. Uh, I saw some people some, some people really liked the, the comedy, some people really liked the horror, some people didn't like either, which is perfectly fine. You're not like a bad person if you don't like this movie. I really felt like both worked. Like, holy crap. And I, I'm, I'm really glad that we are getting... I, I think that horror comedy... Like, we've had great horror comedies for decades. The original Fright Night is a classic. I'm glad that... It's, it seems like they are getting to be more, like, accepted by mainstream audiences that... Because it's just... It's, it's a really outdated idea that you cannot have comedy and another major genre. You know, here we have horror comedy. I would argue the, um, uh, the classic Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid is a really excellent... That's not really a horror movie, but... I guess uh, it's it's maybe by the time standards and the, the the standard of the Western, it is perhaps an action thriller comedy, and that one when it came out, like even even Ebert didn't like it, and you know what was I, I want to say was Lindsay Ellis and uh, Tom the Shadows I forget his uh, last name. The, that had this running joke of, oh, Roger Ebert loves every movie that he watches, which is, of course, a bit of an exaggeration, but, yeah, he has positive things to say about some movies that you're like, really, you like that movie? You know. Today, and, and yeah, and, and I recently um, watched and did a video on the uh, uh, Jennifer's Body, which was also... You know, one of the things that was negatively received about that movie was some people didn't feel like, you know, yeah, the the horror and comedy mix. Uh, 
you know, but yeah, this one does a really great job. I think when you build a lot of tension, it is necessary to relieve that tension, and you can relieve that tension, you know, you, you don't have to use comedy, you can do it in other ways, but comedy, comedy allows you to relieve the tension without resolving the cause of tension, and that's really useful for making, for, yeah, for keeping, you know, I've seen horror movies that refuse to have any jokes and don't resolve the, the cause of tension, and after a while, they're just exhausting to watch. It's like, okay, I get it, you're scary, just ease off a tiny bit. And, yeah, a lot of these horror comedies, they manage to relieve, relieve the tension without, you know, where, but, but it's, there's still a threat out there. Now... Uh, yes, yeah, so back to critic quote. Ready or Not is remarkably successful at hitting its own sweet spot for such a modest movie. Most impressively, the movie effortlessly ba balances its slasher suspense with an acid tongue humor, keeping the film from feeling like a parody. That's very true. It's not a parody. And some, this is high praise. Some say it is the heir to De Palma's best horror. Damn! I am not 100% certain that I would go that far. Uh, De Palma's problematic, but, uh, yeah, an absolute master of, of films, including horror. Part of the fun is understanding the family dynamic despite meeting them under, under heightened circumstances. Very true. It's wildly entertaining, at, and at a tight 90 minutes, it crackles with energy, never letting your attention waver. Very true. As the bungling archetypes run riot within the mansion, it's clear that this is a horror that knows its strengths and undeniably operates best in its more playful moments. The result is loads of bloody fun. And let's see. Uh, ready or not heralds the arrival of a fantastic talent in Tomorrow Weaving, as well as directors Matt Bellini, Gold Open, and Tyler Gillett. Even by its own humble standards, the plot... It's actually, it's fairly appropriate, like, Tyler Gillette's last name is almost spelt like Gillette. And, yeah, the movies are razor sharp in wit and very bloody. So it's, it's you know, which I, it's, I don't think I use Gillette, but I hear that they're not super bloody. You know, they're, they're good at keeping you, at preventing you from accidentally cutting yourself shaving, but, yeah. Even by its own humble standards, the plot... Ah, uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, some people didn't like the... The way the plot is worked out, and the dialogue, and the social commentary, which it, I thought it was great, yeah. Think of Meet the Parents as reimagined by Stephen King, and you'll get some idea of what to buckle yourself in for with the twisted bizarre offerings in this knockout horror comedy skillfully directed with a terrific balance of laughs, scares, and gore. Very true. Meet the Parents, imagined by Stephen King. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. That is an excellent way to... Because, yeah, it, it really does... It, like, some of the in-laws really do not like Grace. And there is that the, the tension of, you know, entering into a new family and this whole... You know, Alex, the, the groom, has chosen Grace... But his family hasn't. The the in-laws did not have a say in the matter. So some of them are very unhappy about the the choice of Grace. Ready or Not is a vehicle to entertain, to mock the elite. Let's see. Um, a completely funny satire about the upper class, the rules imposed by society, and even marriage. So if you want to have a great time with blood and guaranteed laughter, run and watch Ready or Not. Funnier than most comedies and scarily thought-provoking when it needs to be, Ready or Not is a sneaky little surprise. It establishes Samara Weaving not only as a scream queen for a new generation, but also, in my opinion, a star. Bedellini Open and Gillett craft around their Hitchcock blonde a suspenseful mousetrap that's also a cheeky satire about rich sociopaths who will turn to lawlessly inflicting pain on others if it keeps their wealth intact. And let's see. Yeah, some people say, you know, 
in my opinion, it is definitely similar to Get Out. And overall, I, f I feel like Get Out, I'm not sure there's anything about that movie that should be changed even the tiniest little bit. I can, I can, there's maybe a few minor things here. But Get Out is essentially a perfect movie. I don't agree that this is just like a ripoff of Get Out. You know, for for sure, like both of them, you know, th this one is with, you know, poor people versus rich people, whereas Get Out is black people and, and white people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, and yeah, like I... There are there are some completely different things about like I recommend both of these movies uh, just yeah I I think both of them do exceptionally well at the thing they're doing and they're also they're very different kinds of horror movies like yeah this has a bit of a slasher thing going whereas basically the, the it's not quite a slasher but it it's it's very inspired by slashers, you know, it's it's perhaps, yeah, you know, the same way that the original Halloween helped inspire slashers, but is not itself a slasher. That one's also excellent. But yeah, Get Out, I mean, uh, is that a spoiler? I, I don't think so. Get Out is more like a sort of Rosemary's Baby um ah crap what what is it called i know who was in it so i'll be able to find it real quick so nickel Nic nicole kidman also an aussie like samara weaving was in it and it was from 2004 the remake was and it was called the stepford wives you know that's what get out is doing uh, that's hugely different from this like i don't think there's something wrong with i i really I'm I'm thrilled that we're getting all this criticism of, you know, I mean, even um, Jordan Peele himself wanted to keep criticizing, wanted to, to talk about class. Us is hugely different from Get Out. You know, it, it's, there's a lot of, it's a, it's a target rich environment. Let's see... A brilliant concept for satir satirizing the poison pill of dynastic wealth through the kitschy, honest to blog tone. Uh, oh, they felt that the tone holds it back. I disagree. Let's see. Um, yeah, this person says the the characters are are thin. I mean, yeah, they're they're supposed to be. The dark comedy offers plenty of laughs as Clue meets Rosemary's Baby. Yeah, yeah, there is some of that going on. In the bloody entertaining film driven by a superb Samara weaving. A delightfully demented comic romp, short, sweet, and nasty. A gleeful fantasia of over-the-top gore and outlandish action that takes direct aim at the exploitation of the poor by the wealthy. Ray or not is deeply critical of the class structure, not just in terms of the power and privilege of the wealthy, but in how that power and privilege is both imposed on and supported by the lower classes. Yeah. And... Uh, let's see... What a decadent blast to watch, a comic takedown of the rich, done with the rude energy of a horror thriller, the courage of its own manic anti-marriage convictions. I don't really agree that it's so much anti-marriage as anti-marriage if rich people are involved. But I, I can understand how some people would read it as anti-marriage. The, uh, let's see... This very black comedy plays on the fine line between horror and farce, juggles horror tropes and family dynamics with aplomb, and a whole lot of gore. Uh, 
The real fun comes from the way it subverts its time-tested story, balancing wry commentary and straightforward horror in its portrait of fumbling arrogance and curdled privilege. Yes, this really subverts uh, tropes very, very nicely. I, I know that wasn't what the critic was saying, but that was that was something I wanted to say. There's a lot of times in this where you think you know what's going to happen next, and then it's something completely different, and yet it never, like, I do, I'm not sure I would quite say it's as good as the, the, the Jordan Peele, you know, yeah, I already mentioned Get Out is better. I would probably say, overall, this is probably better than, than Us, but... It, the, the, like Jordan Peele, they understand that when you do horror comedy, for the horror to work, it is necessary to sometimes play them straight. But for the audience to not just be like, okay, and then that, oh, yeah, knew it. It's important to sometimes subvert the, the horror tropes. Because horror has been around for a while, and some of these, you know, there there there's a huge amount of horror movies and you know some would go so far as to say that everything has been done in horror i wouldn't quite go that far and and yeah you know movies like this get out us some of the things they they do feel like things we've seen before so yeah sometimes you know if if you never play it straight if you never let a horror trope play out in your horror comedy it ends up basically becoming a parody of horror, which is also fine. There's nothing wrong with doing that if that's what you want to do. That's clearly not what Jordan Peele and the Radio Silence duo want to do, though. And, yeah, there, there are things in this where, yeah, sometimes exactly what the... the yeah, so, so that's... Uh, yeah. And you could easily, like, this could very easily have been written as playing it completely straight and not subverting horror tropes or just a parody and constantly subverting horror tropes. And... Imagine the entirety of the worst possible marriage crammed into the span... Uh, yeah. Like Clue conjoined with Game Night, in a mad scientist lab, it comes to life as a monster all its own. Very true. Some people say the commentary is light and subtle. I don't think I would go... No, that I disagree. 100% hard pass. It is not subtle, and it shouldn't be. To some, money is the root of all happiness, and simultaneously the root of all evil. In a world overrun by the rich and powerful, ready or not serves up a slice of... Uh, yeah, that's, yeah. It's a rare beast, a satire that works both as commentary on a style and an exemplar of the style itself. And the inky black comedy plays like a game of Clue gone mad with arterial spray. And... Yeah, some, you know, in addition to Rosemary's Baby, some, you know, some say the sassy, snarky tood of Heathers. I have to admit I haven't watched that, but based on what I've heard, yeah. Ready or Not is a skewering of the greediness of the 1% at the hands uh, of the person who came from, uh, let's see. It's, yeah, they say it's very American. If that's not American, then I don't know what is. Yeah, see, see one person here says it lacks the edge, of, uh, edge and subtlety of Get Out. I agree that, you know, the, the thing with Get Out, I love that movie, but it's apparently too subtle for some people. Like, some people did not at all understand what Jordan Peele was trying to say when, like, I mean, yeah, actually, honestly, the first time I watched it, I was like, is that, is that what it's saying? You know, I, and then later I watched, like, interviews uh, with, with him and, and read stuff that was written about it. It's like, oh, that's what it's doing. Okay, yeah, sure, I see it now. But, you know, I think you have to be very in denial to watch this movie and not catch that it is critical of the rich. But, yeah, some people, some people completely misunderstood what Get Out is actually 
criticizing. And yeah, let's see. Um, it's the kind of movie where it would seemingly be easy to get out of the situation, so they have to keep inventing reason why it isn't. I see what they mean. I disagree, though, but that is something that some have felt and some future viewers might feel. So, you know, if you, if you worry that that might bother you, this might not be for you. Let's see. And yeah, a lot of people love weaving from other movies already. Adam Brody has complex relationships with various characters. Where is he going to land? Every character has something memorable about them, something that makes them pop. The movie embraces the silliness of the concept. They managed to get the tone exactly right. Comedy, thriller, horror. The lead we know very little about is the characters around her that we get to know. I wish they went further, more bonkers, but they held back. I think it. I, I think if, if it went more bonkers, I think you risk people losing sight of the class warfare. That's yeah. Not as much catharsis as expected. That is true. Um, and and I think yeah. I'll talk about that in the spoiler section. I do think I understand why some people. You know, I knew because I you know uh, watched that review that said not as much catharsis as expected i can understand why some people you know and this critic didn't say that oh it ruined the movie just you know it it wasn't yeah it wasn't exactly what he expected and let's see he felt the finale wasn't as impactful as it could be i don't hmm Okay, I think I'll, I'll try to get back to that uh, when I talk spoilers. Filmed like the Addams Family, that's true. Very convincing gore, mostly. And let's see, yeah, I think it works that we don't know very much about Samara Weaving's grace. I, I felt like, because at the end of the day, you don't need a super complex character as the protagonist of this kind of thing. It's not really about her. I mean, it almost, it's almost kind of perfect because the family don't think that she's, you know, she, she is the protagonist, but this family doesn't think that this is her story. They think it's theirs because they're that self, who looks at a bride's wedding day and says, I may not be the bride, but this is all about me. That's how deluded and, and just awful these rich people are, you know, just, it's, it's so perfect that we honestly don't know that much and we don't learn a huge amount about her either. You don't need a super complex character at the, I, I think if the character was very complex, there's a risk that some people would think it was more about them when really the, the target here is the rich. Some people wish it had a Guardians of the Galaxy soundtrack. Uh, I I mean, to each their own. I love the Guardians of the Galaxy movies and soundtracks. I don't think that would have been as... It would have completely changed the tone. I, I think it worked perfectly the way that... Yeah. Uh, the twists are small. It reminds me of your next. Some people preferred the suspense to the comedy and wished... You know, when, whenever the comedy was was there, they was they were hoping it would go back to suspense. And let's see, it's slickly put together. Benizolini, open and Gillette make the interiors of the mansion, Toronto's Casa Loma, look amazing. All shot in a golden honeydew light, and they show an expert understanding of it audience anticipation and desire the lay in uh, yeah the lay in a shot make us wait wait to see the uh, yeah the stomach churning thrill is in the waiting the reveal becomes a horrid release and in in this way the directors play the audience like a fiddle throughout the film the packed house of the theater hall gasped laughed and screamed in unison as if it were a chorus being directed by a macabre conductor. 
As the film reached its, its raucous conclusion, we were left ragged, exhilarated, and in awe, or, as I said on Twitter, ready or not, fucking rocks. I think that covers everything for direction. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. So, that... Yeah, uh, I am not going to give away the opening of this movie, but I will just say it really tells you right away, like, you get the sense that there's something more going on because of what it chooses to show at, at the start of the film. And, uh, like, there are a lot of modern horror movies where they're just terrified that the audience does not have any patience and they're like, we gotta put, like, something big at the very start. This movie and Get Out, and I think also Us, I, I have to admit it's been a while since I watched. But yeah, these do put something important at the opening, but it's motivated. There's a reason why it's at the opening. It's not just because they think that the audience doesn't have patience. And, yeah, the opening titles are good. I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but it definitely fits the, the yeah, it, it fits what came before. I, I, I love the ending. Uh, some, some critics did, some critics hated it. Um, yeah, some, some people said the, the ending crosses a line and you're either on board with it or not. That is true. Yeah, I, I, um, yeah, there's, there is no uh, Deus Ex Machina or other convenient writing in, in the ending, and just, yeah, um, the entire last chunk of the movie is just pitch perfect, and I know some people said, oh, I wish more of the movie was like that, I don't think they would have been able to sustain that, I, I think... If you wanted more like that, yeah, you could maybe have a little bit more, but then it'd have to be like a short film, and the entirety was like that. This is not, you know, this is, yeah, somewhat like the movie Mother, uh, which I also love. After a while, it changes, and then there's like, it's, it's stuff that you didn't necessarily completely see coming, and it's, it's bigger than you maybe expected and it just works incredibly well but you couldn't have the entire movie like that it would be exhausting even beyond that the budget definitely didn't allow them to be you know this is not a paul w sanderson movie where you know a lot of his recent movies he'll have just like a tiny bit of really big stuff and you can tell oh you spent like Dozens of millions of dollars on that one chunk of, I don't know, 20 minutes of a movie. And the rest of it were just kind of waiting around for you to do something fun. I, I do enjoy his movies. Now, uh, let's see. Yeah, no post credit scene. You don't really need to stay through the end credits. And... That brings us to the character. So, yes, Samara Weaving plays Grace, Alex's young bride. And as you may have guessed or heard, she is the niece of Hugo Weaving and equally as talented, which is a lot. Or, as some people who posted something on the internet but chose not to fact check, she's the daughter of Hugo Weaving, which I'm sure is a surprise to him and her. And... Let's see. Yeah, you know, she is not interested in their money. She just wants a family. And they make that clear very early on. And let's see. Um, Honestly, okay, I want to talk about this, but it's kind of a spoiler. So I am going to... Uh, Yeah, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and copy this stuff into the spoiler section. Uh, hold on. Oh, actually, yeah, it does go. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, she gives a really solid performance. I can't give too much away. 
Um, I will say you there's a very strong sense of like working class. Like she's clearly not rich. You know, it's it's a very yeah, they, they do a really great job. And actually, you know, sometimes I talk about character introductions. The very first thing we, you know, we see her in the the wedding dress. And she is, like, yeah, I guess it's, is it her vows? I think, yeah, she's basically practicing her vows. So just, like, immediate, and, and you know, she expresses some nerves, sure. she She's a little anxious, but... She definitely wants this, and that's, you know, that's some of the most important about her character. It's it's critical to her character that she is not a, um, yeah, she's not there for their money. Adam Brody plays Daniel Ledoma. Some of them pr pronounce it so it kind of sounds like dumbass, which is very appropriate. And I, I have to wonder if, like, straight up the directors were like no no you're supposed to pronounce a dumbass and some of them went with it and others were like i can't i can't say that my family name is dumbass come on but yeah um daniel is not happy about what is happening and there is this great like you don't quite know he's very much a wild card you don't know where he's what exactly he's going to do where he's going to land and they play with that really well. I, I gotta say, I know some people apparently hate Adam Brody. Um, I haven't watched all of his work. I haven't watched all of his interviews. I'm not gonna, you know, maybe there's reason to, to hate. I have only seen him in this, the, um, the aforementioned Jennifer's Body, and Shazam, and in a few months, I'll see him again in Shazam 2. I have loved his performance in all three of these. I think he does an incredible job. I love him as this kind of, like... There's a, there's a sort of darkness to him, but he also, like, tries to, to... Like, there's clearly something going on that you can't tell from right away. And he's like, there's this sort of like he's he's hiding it, but you can tell from his eyes, there's something that he, you know, there's something that he's hiding, and like you're you're either kind of like hoping, what, what is it though? I want to see it, you know. There's this m mystery to either that or you're like, please keep it hidden because you are fucking terrifying right now. So that's. Oh right, he is. He's in Scream Four. I completely, I I real. I remember that a few. Well, yeah. I looked up if I seen him in other stuff a few days ago. And it's like, oh yeah, he's one of the deputies. I completely forgot about that. Um, I hope to watch that movie again before Scream Six. I'll so I'll, yeah, be comparing. I don't know he just he doesn't stand out. I mean, there are actors in that movie who really stand out, and I'm I'm. You know, I I wish he, I could say he was one of them, but but yeah, he's just not. There's there's so many new characters, you know, and and a lot of the actors I did not know from anything else. So you know, I I latched on to the ones I already knew, whether from other screen movies or you know, it, it was uh, I I I already knew Hayden Panettiere from Heroes before I watched it. So latched on to her character. I don't think I want to give away exactly, like, there's definitely a couple of standout characters in that, but I feel like if I say which ones, you're gonna know what, you know, part of that movie is the mystery, so, yeah. Isien Kelichi plays a young Daniel Ledemas, Mark O'Brien plays Alex Ledemas, and he does a, a good job, because he, he has to balance, like, he knows his family, and he does love Grace, and he's a little worried about the, the, just, yeah. But yeah, there's, there's some really good stuff in them. And Chase Churchill plays a young Alex Le Domas. Henry Cherney plays Tony Le Domas, and 
various critics have pointed out he's the most evil of the entire family and he just I've, I've seen him in almost nothing but he's just really really good at being someone that we just despise I mean he's one of the good guys in the first um, Mission Impossible but you just hate his guts. You just, you know, and they, they did need that because, like, a lot of that movie is, you know, Tom Cruise going against, like, he's he's on his own. So you do need a hateable, you know, it, it, like, we can't watch that movie and be sitting there, like, going, why doesn't he just go back to his people? Henry Jerno tells us why he doesn't just go back. And he's apparently going to be in the new one. So that's great. Andy McDowell plays Becky Le Domas. I'm really glad that she is still acting. Like she's still incredibly like she has the she has the charm, she has the the wit and just like and there's this great thing about how she actually she's extremely welcoming of Grace. Like she's like are you nervous? It's okay. We're everybody's nervous on their wedding day. We're so glad that you got Alex back to the family. Uh, I can't tell you how much that means to us. You know, so just, yeah. And, right, Kate Ziegler plays a young Becky Le Domas. And Melanie Scrofano plays Emily Le Domas. She is one of the standouts, but really this is a movie full of people that you're just, that you're really gonna remember, but yeah. I'm going to go ahead and quote a fellow critic. Why do they keep giving her weapons? Some of them are bigger than her. She is useless with them. Every time we see her, she's doing lines of coke and popping pills. It's hilarious. And it really, like, if if I... Yes. If, if there was a... Uh, um, if someone demanded of me only one character... In this movie, uh, all of the rest of them, you know, just like, yeah, yeah. Someone, someone demanded that they're they're gonna, you know, whether I like it or not, they're going to make a a fan edit of the movie. They're gonna edit out every single character except one. Emily is is absolutely my favorite. That's it's not even a it's not even a question. It's not even like. Well, no, no, she is so much fun, and just, yeah, I, I, I want to see her in more, even if she plays it completely differently. Christian Brun plays Fitch Bradley, and he's got this, like, he is, a, he is stuck with a weapon that he really does not think that is going to be, you know, he's ba basically like he, he is being asked to wield a crossbow and he looks at it and he's like, I don't know how to use this. You know, what, what the fuck? Why am I, why am I using this thing when it's, you know, so there's this part where he, not a spoiler, don't worry. You know, he like ducks into the, the bathroom and he's like sitting there watching you know, crossbow use for dummies or something like that. It's just, it's so funny. Just, yeah. Elise Levesque plays Charity Le Doma, and her name is very tongue-in-cheek. Like, holy shit, they actually named her Charity. They actually named her Charity because she is very much, she is all about the money. She married into the family, and she just wants the money. And, uh, yeah, and it's just, yeah, she's incredibly funny, and it's this great thing where, like, she's married to Daniel, who's, like, the the least convinced of, of the, you know, you know, other than Alex, but the, the, and they're, like, I, I don't think they say one nice word to each other, like, they're constantly sniping at each other and it's so funny and it's it's it is the you know there's there's the trope of the old married couple they are very much an old married couple like holy shit like you almost wonder why are they to get just get a fucking divorce you hate each other's guts but the answer is money you know so so yeah 
well, yeah, the the um, she wants the money. He he's you know if they got a divorce, he would still have the family's money. She married into the family. He was born in the family. But yeah, you know the the um, yeah, like I, I think he could do pretty much anything, and she would never demand a divorce. And you know, credit to him for not taking advantage of that. But yeah, like the the. Um, that is it for Anne and Nikki Guadani plays Helen Ledemas and oh my god, um, a lot of it is actually just her face. Like she has lines, but even when she isn't speaking, and it's this. Yeah, I don't. I um, I'm gonna say that in the spoiler section. Uh, so real quick. There we go. Because that's too funny to not say, but it's too spoilery to give away. I did not mean for that to rhyme. But I did that time. Elena Dunkelman plays a young Helena de Damas. John Ralston plays Stevens. And he's like, I, I want to say butler. I think he's the butler. And he loves this... I uh, It's this Tchaikovsky... Yeah, that's... I don't think I need to be more specific than that. He is constantly like humming it or or vocalizing it or listening to it on the radio and like ah oh, it's amazing just best song ever and it's just yeah he's he's so much fun. Liam McDonald plays Georgie Bradley, Ethan Tavares plays Gabe Bradley, the the younger of the um yeah of Hannah K. Talbot plays Clara, Celine Tsai plays Tina, and Daniela Barbosa plays Dora. They are the the maids of the yeah. Andrew Anthony as Charles. I I'm not sure who Charles is. Uh gotta say. A lot of characters in this movie. Nat Faxon as the voice of Justin, and he's I don't want to give it away, but he just, yeah, uh, props to him. Doesn't have a huge role. Very funny with what he's given. And there are, in fact, cameos by Guy Busick, R. Christopher Murphy, and producer James Vanderbilt. And Vanderbilt is the... He, he helps write the, the screen movies that the Radio Silence duo are doing. I think he is part of the overall team of Radio Silence. But he doesn't direct. He's usually a producer and sometimes writer. But, yeah. Uh, huge props to him. I think he did an incredible job. I, I forget. Was he the only writer of Scream 2022? I'll find it real quick. I'm not sure he was the only writer. Oh, that's right. Him and Guy Busick, but not our Christopher Murphy. But yeah, uh, they do great writing on this and on Scream 2022. I am psyched for Scream 6. I, I yeah, I would be extremely surprised if I disliked that movie, considering the writing for the, yeah. Now, I think that is basically what I have to say about the characters. So, uh, yeah, the dialogue is excellent. Like, an argument could be made that there is an overall voice, but you can still tell what the different characters... They will say specific things based on who they are and and the the situation and such but for sure like i can understand like some people were were really bothered by the um let's see yeah some some people really didn't like how much swearing there is in this and it is like there's more than you might think uh i don't like 
there's very little other than using hateful language i don't really think there should and and you know don't like put offensive language in like kids movies of course other than that i think you should be allowed to to do what you you know i will say at first i thought that maybe the the you know at first it seemed like basically like grace will occasionally swear which is like you know she's she's working class so swearing is a bit more but a number of the family members also swear and i don't know if that's supposed to say yeah i guess it's that you know she's just being herself but they pretend to be fancy and so, you know and she doesn't like she's not like constantly saying fuck you to the family she's like swearing when she's by herself and thinking out loud kind of you know but they don't <sighs> see i think some people might accidentally read that as you know swearing means that you're not like good because the but but i it would have felt weird if grace didn't swear but the family did yeah I, I think to an extent there is some going on of like they're trying to appeal to to you know three edgy five me teenagers that love swearing yeah it didn't bother me I think I I think it would have been good if it was like yeah that, yeah so the thing is to some people swearing is just cool and that's fine uh, you know I. I think it certainly can be cool in in the right circumstances. So if only the fa if the f family swears, but Grace doesn't, then some people would think, ah, she's not as cool as yeah. It's it's difficult. It's it is loaded in the in in that kind of way, not in the wealth kind of way. Some people really didn't like the dialogue. I thought. There, I don't know that there's any lines that I would really change. Uh, uh, you know, possibly the the swearing for reasons I just went into. But uh, okay, so some people felt the following. Some user reviews said, "Is this a spoof? The dialogue sounds like it was poorly translated from the language. The dialogue was badly written and spoken even and spoken badly, even by good actors because they were given such bad material. It is not funny and the acting is bad, but it does get better in the last third. So yeah." I, th I think all three thirds were great. And that brings us to the cinematography, which was handled by Brett Jutkiewicz. And other than this, he has DP'd Stranger Things. He's, yeah, he's a cinematographer on 36 completed titles, and he has one upcoming. And yeah, yeah. He, other than this movie, I haven't watched Stranger Things. I don't have Netflix. I don't really intend to. Other than this, he DP'd Scream, also with the Radio Silence crew. The Black Phone. Uh, I guess that might be the ones that I know, but I'll briefly skim. Uh, yeah, those are the ones I know. Oh. And he edited eight things. Cool. There's, There are some DPs who also edit, but a lot who don't. Anyway, yeah, he does a really solid job here and on the aforementioned that I also watched. Now, uh, let's see. Yeah, so the, the various critic quotes. Is, its biggest failing for me was the photography, too much of which is caked in overgraded green. The final shot is fab, though. Indeed, the whole climax is an all-timer. The the over the the heavily graded green is definitely. I mean, a chunk of the movie is set at night, so, and and there's there's hiding, so. Yeah, grading it green does make a lot of sense. I can understand why. I, I don't think it was amazing. Let's go with that. Uh, the, the grading, the color grading. Now, I, I do think most of the, the camera movement is great. 
Uh, the duo are not shooting a masterpiece here either. The pair come from a found footage horror background, having worked on the anthology film VHS and the feature Devil's Do, and that history is felt in Ready or Not. And uh, let's see. Yeah, um, there's one at least one scene shot in Delirious Handheld. And for a stretch after this, the handheld disappears. One starts to think the. That part was a fluke, but when, uh, let's see. Yeah, there are other times where they use handheld. It isn't a choice that ruins the movie, and the two directors throw in a couple of interesting ideas to mix it up, but there is an undeniable pothole whenever the handheld returns. In one particular glaring instance, the camera almost loses weaving as she runs across the fame frame because the camera is bobbing so erratically. See, I watch this on my computer. You know, I'm as close to the, you know, the, yeah, yeah, you can't see it, but I put the camera right on top of the monitor, which means that I'm as close to the monitor now as I was while watching, well, some of the time I, I wasn't this close, but yeah, for, for a chunk of it, I was this close to the, the image and, you know, it's only it's a it's a it's a large-ish monitor, but it is a monitor. It's not a, a cinema screen. I can totally imagine because the the review I just quoted from was from a review that came out in 2019. Someone who had watched it in theaters. I can totally understand. Like I'm. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that I I have to tell anyone don't watch it in theaters since the movie is no longer in theaters. But yeah, like if yeah. If you have a choice, I I would probably recommend watching it by yourself in front of a, a computer monitor or a or a TV that doesn't take up an entire wall, rather than like you know I I know some people like arrange that the and a group of people will watch and like project it onto you know uh, yeah project the the movie onto a wall yeah I don't think. That would be quite as good of an experience, and to even you know, even compared to other 2019 movies. So, but but yeah, I thought they did a, a really good job. Um, although you know, to, yeah, to be fair, I I believe they were shooting for they they knew that it would go to theaters. It's not that they were intending as uh, you know. So so there is you know it's so so it is an issue arguably. You know, comparatively, like, I think it makes a lot of sense to go easy on Robert Rodriguez for, you know, some of the decisions he made on the, um, I can't believe I'm blanking on the name, um, before Desperado, El Mariachi, because he did not anticipate that hitting theaters. He didn't expect, you know, so he made a movie that would work for the Mexico, the, the Mexican renting market, you know, so when you watch that movie, if you watch it on a big screen, it is like, was this really shot for a big screen? It wasn't, and, you know, I'm not saying it's, it's perfect, there's just some decisions he made on that that I disagree with, but, you know, yeah, on, on this one, you know, and, and they did much better, on Scream 2022, and I'm sure they have on, uh, yeah, Scream, Scream 2023, yeah, Scream 6 this year as well. It might have been like a budget thing, I could imagine, and, and just, yeah, you know, if they're very used to a certain way of doing things, then that's sometimes what you keep doing, even if you get into a bigger, yeah. This was edited by Terrell Gibson, who also edited two episodes of Hawkeye. Sorry to Bother You, which I haven't watched, but I hear is great and well edited. And that's about... Yeah, so, so in total, uh, 21 editing credits. And yeah, uh, let's... Right, yeah, so this is a, um, 
Yeah, a couple of credit quotes. The editing too conf confuses the action too much. In one or two key scenes, the shot cuts away too quickly to really get a grasp on what action was occurred during the shot. Context clues fill in the blanks, of course, but it makes for unintentionally jarring scenes. The editing doesn't lend much of a severed hand either, as what should be the most intense moments of conflict are often difficult to see due to choppy cuts and a camera that flails around like it's a found footage film. I will definitely say there were a couple of times, most of the time, I, I liked the editing, but there were just... Let's see, there was a part where, like... It cut, and I wasn't quite sure. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, it's not a spoiler to say. There's a there's a scene where someone is looking for someone, and they use a mirror to. You know, there's a there's a stationary mirror that they look into, and I couldn't tell if the mirror was or wasn't showing the person who was hiding because because it's it's a great like it means the person doesn't have to crawl you know to to turn the corner and a mirror you might not think about or you might have more difficulty you know it's not that difficult to make you know to to shrink and and like hug a wall and get close to you know but yeah i watched the entire movie i i am not entirely sure if the mirror did show the, the hiding person, and if not, why not? Because it really seemed like it should have. And, and that, yeah, but, but by and large, I, I really, this was, I, I, I'm not sure I, actually, I, I might have already said, but in a, in a recent video, I miss reaction shots. I miss the way things used to be edited. I think movies today are in too much of a hurry. Uh, I like re-watching movies that are decades old. A uh, couple of months ago, my dad and I re-watched Blues Brothers, which we are wont to do. We both love that movie. I had forgotten how great the editing, how, how well it uses reaction shots to increase how funny or tense something is. And this movie actually, it, it cuts to people's reactions and it it compares and contrasts i i really loved seeing it and and yeah i i hope to see more i i there's so many movies today that don't follow this you know i, I get it it used to be necessary it isn't as necessary you know today it basically isn't necessary you know that used to be how we can tell that something is scary they'll cut from the the creature which, you know, before something like Star Wars, special effects were not particularly impressive. You know, it was basically like, oh, eh, nice, uh, you, you did the thing, you know. And it would cut to, like, a woman screaming so we can say, oh, it is, it's scary. Okay, I wasn't sure, you see, but uh, yeah, I'm joking. Obviously, it's to increase the tension. And if you cut away from the creature to a reaction, then when you cut back to the creature maybe like it's in a different phase of the makeup effects so you know because like it used to be that you couldn't really do all of the effects out you know today you can you can make it with if especially if you use cgi or, or stuff like that you know but it used to be that you had to cut to a reaction shot in order to move the the you know because you can maybe you can maybe you know, yeah, limited movement from the from the uh, animatronic puppet, and then uh, you know, but but yeah, there are there are times in this where the editing, like, um, ah, crap, I don't think I can really give any examples without spoiling anything, but just yeah, it'll it'll cut between. For example, different members of the family, and they're reacting to something in a very different way based on their personality, and just, it was, it was incredibly funny, you know, um, yeah, very, very much proving the Kuleshov effect, and I don't know, I mean, I guess maybe Andrei Tarkovsky wasn't really 
that good of a filmmaker. I'm kidding. Oh, wow. I couldn't even get through that with a straight face. Holy shit. No, seriously. If you if you haven't watched any Tarkovsky, he's a goddamn genius. Anyway. But he apparently liked invisible editing. You know, editing that doesn't call attention to itself. And he disagreed with Kuleshov. Anyway. Seriously, though. Um, there's a bit of a, a Cold War thing where Americans don't like stuff that comes from Russia. But, like, it's not, you're not going to watch a Tarkovsky movie and walk out, you know, like, applauding for Stalin until your hands hurt. You know, they're, they're, some of them do have some, some of the, their politics, but, like, it's not going to infect your mind or something. Just, yeah. And, let's see. Um... guess that yes so that brings us to the box office and budget so this was made on a six million dollar budget which yeah you know before they proved themselves that was what they could get for one movie which you know i'm just briefly going to find so you know this was how they proved themselves so scream 2022 was made on a budget of 24 million dollars so for those playing the home game that is four times as many four times as much money to work with and that's because the box office for this movie was 57.6 million dollars so that's almost 10 times it made almost 10 times its budget back and this wasn't like one of those movies where they throw a huge amount of money on like marketing the way that you know there, there are some like extremely expensive movies that also spend other than the filmmaking budget there's the marketing budget but this you know yeah so um this was filmed in toronto and um Oshawa, which is also in Ontario, and the, yeah, they found a great, like the, the, yeah, it's called, in reality, it's called the Parkwood Estate, that doubles for the Ladomas Estate, they got a lot of mileage out of it, it's, yeah, um, there's all these, like, even, even very early on, you're told, oh, there's, like, uh, um, hidden passages for, like, servants to, to move through, you know, and, like, I mean, overall, I have seen much older movies that made even better use of mansions, but I, it's, I try not to judge modern movies too much based on, because, because it's just, there's a lot of things modern movies do that I hope eventually they move away from and go back to the classics, but anyway, yeah, um, yeah, there's there's hidden passages for like servants to use, and just it's it's a massive mansion, and there's a there's a, um, there are so many corridors and rooms, and they get a lot of like they 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 go to a bunch of different places in this mansion. To it never feels like we're just stuck in a small area. Now, I did see someone criticize that we don't, the, the movie doesn't really, you know, it's, some movies that, that do this sort of thing would take great care early on to establish the geography so that we are well aware of, of that. This movie doesn't do that, and yeah, some people thought that was bad. I think it was exactly right, because that means it is chaotic and confusing for Grace, who's not used to this place, and the viewer. I, I really... That was a great choice, in my opinion. Oh, right, I've... Yeah, this was about the... Yeah, all of the cast really make a meal out of their individual roles. Anyway, yeah, they just... There's... there's a, they, they get a lot out of the... How surprising it is like there there are times where like someone will like open a door or 
you know, just, yeah, go, go follow a different, fo follow a specific, like, path or something. And, like, you, you're completely surprised by what it's, you know, that can wait. Um, you, you're completely surprised by what it leads to, and, yeah. But, but yeah, you know, for sure, like, uh, the original Die Hard does a good job establishing the geography of Nakatomi Tower, and then, you know, for the rest of the movie, it's like, oh, they're at that part. Okay, so that means that they're, you know, if, if you see where the good guys are and the bad guys are, and you know the geography, so you recognize, so you know where they are in relation to each other, you know, it's, it's that kind of thing that I think that other critic was calling for, and I, I think that would have been the wrong choice for, for this. I think it was the right choice for Die Hard. There's some really great uh, costume work. Um, just, yeah, some of, the, some of the things they wear. It's not quite, like, ridiculous, but, yeah. And, and, yeah, Grace's dress, which she may have to adjust... Like, there's a there's an early part where, like, part of her dress gets caught. And she has to, like, start to tear some of, some of the dress. And they make... They, that's a really great element as well. And, yeah, like, legitimately, like... I, I wouldn't call it an action movie, but some of the action scenes, like... With, with chases and physical fights, just... Yeah, they, they, there's some really great... Um, what's the word? They, they come up with some, some, you know, some of, some of it is fun. Some of it is cool. Some of it is scary, but yeah, some, some various scenarios and then have them play out. And this is, this is not one of those, you know, this is an R rated movie. This is a hard R when people fight. It's not one of those PG-13 fights where it's like, oh, I I guess maybe they're dead. There's no blood or wound or anything, but I guess they're dead because that was one of the bad guys and the good guy fought them. So, okay. No, this really lets you know, uh, yeah, people, people get hurt. People get fucked up in this movie and it's glorious. And the music was composed by Brian Tyler. Now, he has 139 done and two upcoming credits as composer, 104 for music department, and 41 for soundtrack. And, yeah, let's see. Oh, yeah, yeah, he's composing for the, the new... Um... Oh, never mind. That was not what it was. Okay. Uh, let's, uh, yeah, he's composed for Yellowstone, the new Chippendale Rescue Rangers. Uh, let's see. I, it, right, yeah, he, he composed for Scream 2022, F9, The Fast Saga, the 2019 Charlie's Angels movie, which I honestly, I haven't watched. I might at some point... I do, I'm, I'm very interested in more work by Elizabeth Banks. Um, I've liked what I've seen. Anyway, uh, Rambo Last Blood was also him. Yeah, I remember, that, that one has some, some really good stuff. The 2017 Mummy. Uh, the Sleepy Hollow series. Triple X, Return of Sander Cage, Now You See Me 2, uh, Age of Ultron, Assassin's, oh, oh, Assassin's Creed, one of the video games, not the movie, Expendables 3, uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, live action, um, yeah, he's done a bunch. And he, he does a really great job at, like, the, um, um, yeah, you know, some, some of it is very, yeah, 
some some dark haunting pulse pounding just really excellent um and apparently he is responsible for this there's this original song i really don't want to give away it's just i'm just gonna say there's an original song and it's amazing and yeah in addition to original score it does also use licensed music and there are 93 minutes worth of soundtrack right here on youtube for free to listen to so yeah i think that is i'm not sure all of the songs on it are used in you know that that also includes the the classical. They, they use a little classical music to, you know, and and some people apparently thought that was like completely unforgivable. It's, I mean, it's a fancy place, fancy people. They're using classical music to establish just yeah. And uh, right, one of the critics points out uh, for the music uh, they use strings and eerie tones, very childlike since it's a game. And the sound design, um, some people think that the, the, um, the sound design is weak. Ah, uh, I thought it was okay. I'm not sure I would say it was, like, amazing. But, yeah, I, I, I don't think it was, like, outright bad. So, the... Um, Right, pacing, um, I keep forgetting to, I, I mean to write down, yeah, I would definitely say if you watch the first half hour, then it is, you know, if, if you don't care about anything that happens after that, based on the first half hour, you might as well stop watching. The movie is just exactly 90 minutes long, like almost to the second, without end credits, and 97 minutes with end credits and again you really did there's no need to to sit through the end credits and the let's see yes so that brings us to the best element the 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 skewering of the rich the satire and the the how it manages to be both funny and tense like i was never it never lost one of those it never stopped being funny. It never stopped being tense. Not not truly. Only temporary. Only very temporarily. Now, uh, I... This is the part where I'm supposed to pick a worst aspect. Um, I suppose... I think the worst thing I could say is that... As far as a class warfare thing, like, it is, there are um, some choices that maybe skew a little too in the, you know, they, I don't really, I don't think they go too far against the, the rich people. I think there are arguably some things that could be interpreted as being against, yeah, um, yeah, on the side of the rich people, and that's obviously not great. Uh, yeah, worst thing, according to others, I mean, I saw several people call it derivative, or, or you know, I'm saying it's too derivative, it's definitely, there's definitely some de de derivation going on, but, uh, yeah, I don't think it's too derivative. I was most worried that the concept would just be too outlandish, and uh, yeah, that is not what happened. I was most looking forward to seeing the successful audition movie for taking over the Scream series, because this is, you know, when there there's a lot of people who individually of each other said Samara Weaving is the next Scream Queen, and the moment that... Yeah, when this came out, I remember hearing people, you know, back in 2019, saying, I hope these guys get to do Scream, because I think they would be great for it. And when it was confirmed that they were going to do Scream, 
there were a lot of people who were saying, I can't wait to see what they do because it's exciting. And I 100% get it. And it's it's not one of those things where, like, oh, I hope they just make the same movie, just call it Scream. No, no, no. This is very different from Scream 2022. But it has the kind of, like, it, it is this thing of being being funny, being tense and and scary and playing with tropes like it it is because because you gotta remember 2022 scream that was the first scream movie i'm aware that the the show was also not it was the first scream movie not directed by the late great wes craven you know and it was this thing of like are we just not gonna have more scream movies because he you know he made he directed the first four and then he he passed and it's like, I'm not sure, like, a lot of us fans of Scream were like, I don't know if anybody else can do it. Like, I don't know if anybody else gets it, you know? And, and yeah, then this came out and it was like, okay, they get it. It's, you know, and, and, yeah, like, not a huge amount of time passed between this coming out and, and them, like, you know, I, I can really quickly look up when they started working on Scream. So, let's see if we say development. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah. Um, March of 2020, it was announced that Radio Silence would be directing the fifth one and the the let's see so radio silence and this movie premiered august 21st of 2019 so less than a year passed before the announcement at which point they already had the you know so so yeah and that makes a lot of sense um this really i uh, I'm very excited by Jordan Peele, and I, I'm going to keep watching his movies, his his horror movies, especially. I, I suppose I'll also watch if he does a straight comedy, but I'm more interested. I think he, he has a, a voice. I don't know that he would be... I, I don't think... I'm, I'm not as interested in his scream as the... the yeah. You know, and that's, that's nothing against him. It's just... I'm not even sure he would be hugely interested. Like even his, like he 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 helped write the new Candyman, and that one's also very different from you know. Yeah, I I don't think that he's super interested in doing Scream, you know. But but yeah, I'm I'm really really glad that these guys are working on Scream, and I hope as long as yeah, like I said earlier, as long as they have ideas. I want to see, I'm, I'm fine with, you know, this is after, so, so yeah, Scream 2022, that was 11 years after the fourth movie. That is actually, that's the second longest wait. You know, there was a 12 year wait. Oh wait, no. Yeah. It was 11 years, wasn't it? Between three and four. So yeah. And now we're getting two two years in a row, you know, yeah, there's, there's not even going to be, like, so, so, yeah, and as long as they have ideas, I'm, you know, I know some people disagree with me on this, but when I watched Scream 2022, I was like, they have ideas, they, this is, this is, this was made by people who have something, you know, because that was one of the things with Scream 3, it felt like they were running out of ideas, you know, and, and, I know, you know, it wasn't Kevin Williamson writing. Aaron Kruger apparently didn't have enough time to, and they have to, they had to like rewrite it while making. You know, I'm I'm not saying I get why it ended up the way it did, but yeah, it was this thing of, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe there are no more good ideas for for what to do with Scream. I think the fourth movie did something interesting, but apparently it wasn't that well received. It wasn't well received enough that they you know, rushed another one into production. But yeah, the 2022 movie, I really felt like, okay, um, these guys love Scream, they understand Scream, and they have ideas, you know. And and like I said in my Scream review, Scream 2022 review, 
I'm not asking them to make the same movie again. You know, I, I would, but I would be very surprised if Scream Six is like Scream 2022 or Ready or Not. So yeah. So the trailer, definitely, you know. The, yeah, some critics have said, do not watch the trailer before watching the movie. It spoils too much. I agree. I chose not to. I watched the trailer after watch. Oh, yeah, I actually, I completely forgot saying. But, yeah, I'm recording this video, like, right after I'm done with the, the movie. Like, all I did after the movies, you know, once the end credits started rolling, the only... The only thing I did was set up the, the lights and the, the movies behind me, watch the trailer, and, and then I started recording. And yeah, definitely do not watch the trailer before, uh, yeah. And cover and poster, same thing. And that, I really wish they would stop doing this because some movies it's actually kind of difficult to avoid looking at, you know, if, if I, when I go to Disney Plus to watch the movie, like, yeah. You know, I can't really avoid seeing the the poster, even if I just, like, really quickly click to, to yeah. But the, the poster, not as much, you know, but the trailer will give you too much, will give too much away. And here on YouTube, I found eight clips. Uh, let's see, two trailers, several TV spots, four music videos, two tributes, 25 review analysis, 12 documentaries, 10 reactions, and yeah, so it's not, it's not like no one is talking about it, you know, sometimes I try to pick something that, like, I feel like this is not getting discussed enough, I want to start a conversation about it, but yeah, a lot of people have already made videos on this. On Rotten Tomatoes, it has an 88% on the tomato meter based on 317 reviews. 280 of them are fresh. It has a 78% audience score with over 5,000 verified ratings. And the average critic rating was 7.20 out of 10. The average user rating was 4 out of 5. And anything over 3.5 out of 5 counts as, you know, a, yeah, so... Of all the people who watched it, only 22% didn't like it enough to give it a 3.5 or more. Smart, subversive, and darkly funny, Ready or Not is a crowd-pleasing horror film with giddily entertaining bite, is the critics' consensus. And yeah, the movie is certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. And on Metacritic, it has a 64 out of 100 and a 7.7 .7 out of 10 for users based on 39 critic reviews and 318 user ratings. And of the critic reviews, 26 are positive, 10 are mixed, and 3 are negative. Only 3 are negative. And of the 318 ratings by users, 249 are positive, 51 are mixed, and 18 are negative. And that... Brings us to IMDb, where it, yeah, there are a thousand and two hundred and four user review, yeah, user reviews, and if you, you know, if you filter out the ones with spoilers, there's a thousand and forty-five left. I read the top voted one hundred of the spoilerless ones, and of the spoilerless ones, of of the top one hundred of the spoilerless ones, five of them gave it one. 3 gave it 2, 1 gave it 3 out of 10, 4 gave it 4, 5 gave it 5, 6 gave it 6. At this point, I was startling, okay, this thing is screwing with me, isn't it? But no, there are 20 who gave it 7, 33 who gave it 8, 13 who gave it 9, 16 who gave it 10. So yeah, some people didn't really love it, but the most positive, the, the most upvoted reviews are the most positive. So yeah, it, by and large, not exclusively, but yeah. Um, and of the 370 links, 231 of them worked and were in English, and it has a 6.8 out of 10, based on 155,511 user, IMDb users voting. And, yeah, 34.4% gave it 7, 20.6 gave it 8, 19.4 gave it 6, 
I'm not sure I really understand anyone giving it less than six, but yeah. Um, 6.8% gave it five, 6% gave it 10, 2.6 gave it four, 1.3 gave it one, 1.2 gave it three, 0 0.7 gave it two. I don't know. I can't help but wonder if at least some of those really, really low votes are people who felt that it was directed at them. Now, let's see. Yes, so this was, this won four awards and was nominated for 24. I'm just going to briefly talk about the wins. Um, it won a Clio Entertainment Award for the theatrical teaser. It won a... Yeah, um, Samara Weaving won Best Actress Fright Meter Award. Um, let's see, it won... Yeah, uh, Best Costume Design in Film Contemporary. And that's... Yeah, it does a really great job. Let's see. Oh, and it also won for the screenplay. Guy Busick and R. Christopher Murphy won for Best Screenplay for the Fright Meter Awards. 2019 that does make a lot of sense and let's see um yes so special effects i'm gonna start with a critic quote kills present utilize a healthy level of gore though that smaller budget starts to rear its ugly head there is some unconvincing cgi blood and that's yeah Sadly true. I, I, they couldn't, some of this stuff they couldn't have done practically, but yeah. And, and for sure, like most of the effects are practical. You can very clearly tell and it, yeah, it's great. Uh, this is one to watch. If, if you love, you know, gory kills and, and slasher movies and such, you know, don't watch it just for that. But yeah, if that is something that matters a lot to you, this does have those and there's some really great stunts. And, yeah, uh, it's not the most violent uh, movie in the world, but there is some, some really gnarly violence and, uh, yeah, really, really cool, inventive uh, kills. You know, it's, it's not the most, you know, in, in that regard, but I, I would say I, I felt, you know, satisfied. I've, I've watched hundreds of horror movies. I've seen a lot of gore so yeah uh let's see it's not really about sexual material there's not really much of that and i already talked about the swearing now i am gonna put a few links right now it's looking like two links in the description box for Reviews to read that I think were great and where I don't really have anything to, to add. You know, in case you're wondering why I didn't just quote them in this. It's it's reviews that I think are great from start, you know, where I, uh, um, yeah, I think the review is great from start to finish. It's not always that I agree with everything they say, but I think the review is great and I don't really have anything to add as such. Now, um, let's see. So, yeah, on Disney Plus, this has no special features. And, yeah. Um, I gotta admit, this is, this is where I give the rating. It is... It's difficult for me to choose between a 7 and an 8. Um, yeah, okay. Yes, I rate this 8 sinister games out of 10 and this is a movie that i i could watch again later today and really enjoy so yeah and that brings us back to the the ranking of the dark progressive films that are horror and or comedy in recent years and that's also, so yeah, I recently watched The Menu, and there's definitely, yes. Okay, so, 
the the ranking i love all of these other than antlers i'm ranking how much i love them not whether or not i love them antlers not okay the menu ready or not barbarian and fresh and let's just make sure that it does the thing there we go yeah that is it for the review so the pilot would like you to acknowledge that the spoiler sign is on so that brings us so yes the rest of this video th this is when we get into the thoughts section the rest of this video is not a review it's a series of well thoughts some of it is analysis some of it's msd3k riff tracks and other jokes and uh, yeah so time codes for all the sections are in the description box and the section the fir this first thought section is thoughts I had while watching in chronological order. You can think of it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. And the section after that is thoughts that I had before watching. And that's also where I put critic quotes that are that that have spoilers. So that yes, I am gonna note the time code. There we go. So that is. That brings us to thoughts that I had while watching. So, I really love that we hear thunder before we see anything. And the first thing we see is the devil-like face of... I think they call him LeBail. Mr. LeBail. And we do a nice old-fashioned dolly you know, camera move across all the games. Some of them board games. And, yeah... Uh, the groom is is sacrificed, and then we go to 30 years later, and, um, let's see, yeah, uh, Grace makes a really positive impression on you right away, like, she, she's so happy about the, the wedding, but she's also, like, a real person, like, they, they knew that they had to do, like, there's, Women have been there. Women have been targets of misogynist jokes about brides for decades. So the moment that you have a bride in a movie, you have to really assert. No, no, no. She's she's a normal person. She's not. What was the bridezilla? I think they used to. You know, this this really hateful stereotype. You know, obviously in real life, women who are happy to get married, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, but yeah, they knew they had to. So yeah, she like. She gets a, a smoke, and she says, like, um, she, she swears some, and just, yeah. And, yeah, here at the start of the movie, Grace and Alex are actually kind of sweet together. And Daniel also makes a, a great impression from right away. You know, she, so, yeah, before we even see him, Grace is like, your brother, your alcoholic brother keeps hitting on me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That we, we don't actually see him do that in the movie, but based on the characterization of him in the movie, yeah, you can you can completely buy that, that he's doing that. And yeah, you know, they, there's very real Big Brother energy when Daniel enters the room and, you know, he like puts Alex in a chokehold and like, um, just, yeah, he's, yeah. And... Yeah, and Alex says, I'm giving you an out. We don't have to do this, you know, and she says that they are, you know, she, she insists, and later he he's like, I mean, you said, I, I tried to tell you, just, yeah. And, you know, and, and yeah, like, at this point in the movie, it seems like, oh, you know, wedding jitters, he's like, he's nervous, and just, no, 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 he's like, Ugh, am I going to have to kill her? And, yeah, we see the, the pictures being taken. I like that we don't see the I do part. Because that is, like, they, they could make some jokes uh, during that as well. Although I think, like, if Helen was, like, during that, that might be pushing it a little. I do love that, like, when we first see her, she's just got this, she's just, like, she, she couldn't look more angry. Like, just, like, holy shit, what, what is... 
what does she think about Grace that makes her that fucking angry? And then for a while, it's like, maybe she's just always angry. Nope. The moment that she's told, you can try to kill Grace. She's like, all smiles. Just like, I, she does a really great job. I really, really like her performance. Just, yeah. And I approve. the. It's It's a bit harsh, but her character is, you know evil rich person so but there's definitely a visual joke going on when you know she's handed the old battle axe because that's what she is she is the old battle axe you know so it's yeah um but but yeah the the i do part you know when she yeah we see her practice some of her vows and then we see you know afterwards and such the i think they were thinking if we see the wedding itself that's going to look too glamorous. That's going to put the audience in the mindset of such a happy union, you know, which is not what the movie is about. So just, yeah. And, you know, the, the yeah, so even before the, before the wedding itself, you know, she says, you know, it was like 18 months bonathon. <laughs> yeah. And the, you know, and yeah, afterwards, they're trying to get it on in the bed, and then suddenly Helen is in the room and still looking so angry. And she's not like, oh, I'm so sorry, I didn't know you were, you know... I, th I didn't know you were gonna consummate? You're married! Married people don't fuck! You know, but no, she's just, you know, <laughs> uh, sorry, Helen, she has boundary issues. <laughs> Yeah, I'll say just yeah, that was that was really funny. And yeah, I uh, you know, there's the you know, you, okay, you have to play a game. Do I have to win? No. You know, I I get that at this point he doesn't think that it's going to be hide and seek. He doesn't think that they're going to try to kill her, but yeah, you know, the She's not really supposed to win. You, you know, poor people don't win when they marry into a rich family. They just get destroyed. And let's see. Yeah, and I, I like the, you know... So, champagne, everyone, you know, and, like, pouring up. And then it cuts, and I love this. It cuts to Daniel, and he's, like, sitting there nursing on a glass of vodka, and it's, like... He didn't even, he didn't need to be told, you know, it's, it's okay to drink that. No, 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 he, he had that drink, like, he's, he's been carrying that drink around for a while now, you know, and, and he's just sitting there, like, trying to get it down as, as quickly, you know, just trying to get as drunk as possible, trying to completely just, that was really funny. Like, this, you know, you, you can, you can sip a little bit of champagne, or you can just sit there and drown yourself in vodka that's also yeah if it that's that's daniel's way to to deal with this and let's see. yeah and and becky is so sweet to grace before the the this, yeah this is still when the ah what's it called the um ah what's the word yeah, yeah, she, she thanks Grace for bringing him back to, to them, and she's like, can you, can you bring him back to the fold? That would be great, you know, before she's been, before she realizes that she's going to, yeah, so the, uh, let's see, I wanted to get the, there we go. And, yeah, uh, uh, let's see, Fitch and M Emily. Both, you know, they, they, they're they super late, and they're not even, like, super apologetic to, like, uh, let's see. Is that? There we go. Um, yeah, you know, they're not even, like, oh, Grace, I'm so sorry, but, you know, there was this, kind of, yeah, what was the thing? Like, they are late because... Fitch can't fucking fly coach anymore. You know, he's, he says something like that. You know, and, and yeah, he, he married into that. He used to be a normal person flying coach. But now, he's, he's like, oh, God, these these pores, they're just, oh, I can't, you know. Let's see. And, 
Yeah, but, you know, they make sure to get there before midnight because they do... Because that's the thing. Like, they're not gonna... Because, you know, again, they weren't, like, stuck. They just didn't want to fly coach. You know, as long... As, so, they, they showed up late because they refused to spend a few hours flying coach. And it's also, like, you needed to be out of... Like, so far away that you couldn't possibly, like, drive... To, to get, you know, like, I mean, it's a, it's a fucking wedding, like, you know the date, you know the time, it's, it's not, like, it's not a fucking surprise party, and he's just like, ah, you know, I can't fly coach, but don't worry, I'm here in time just in case I have to kill the, the in-law that, like, he barely has a chance to meet her before he starts trying to fucking kill her. Let's see. And yeah, and and the kids are wearing the masks, you know, and and like, uh, what's his name? The um, uh, I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Daniel is like, are you are you serious about the mask? You know, and and Fitch is like, no, just let them wear the masks, you know, not caring that you know, thirty years earlier, the masks kind of fucking traumatized. The, the, you know, both Daniel and Alex, so it's like, it's not this minor thing. And the kill, the, the kids, the kids run in shouting, kill, 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 you know, so, yeah. You know, playing that they're, you know, killing the, the yeah, during the hide and seek. And, and... Emily is like, oh, we're going to be BFFs, you know, to, to Grace. And just like, yeah, that was, holy shit. And, and you know, con considering what afterwards, let's see. And uh, let's see. Yeah, and they go, yeah, they go into the game room and we get a family history lesson. I really like, the, you know, later when he's like, oh, Vic, you couldn't have... Couldn't have gotten us a bit of bit of a better deal, motherfucker. <laughs> and yeah, Helen is just still like really, really hates. I, I love the thing where you know, like they pass around the the game box, and Grace is like looking at it, and Helen's like, "Move it," you know, just <laughs> like it's it's a little weird, you know. You can't expect her to be one hundred percent, you know. 100% on the details of this really weird ritual. Like, even if they did not play hide-and-seek, even if they didn't try to fucking kill her, it would still be weird. Like, just, you know, she's sitting there thinking, what the fuck have I gotten myself into, you know? And Helen is like, would you just... We don't have time for this. Do you not understand? There's a deal with the devil. We have to kill... Just, you know, the whole... Yeah. Because, you know, they have to start it before midnight. And then they have to end it before dawn. Uh, let's see, there's the... Um... Right, yeah, and Alex, like, tries to appeal to Tony and say, do, do we really have to do it? You know, he is trying to get them out of just, yeah. And, yeah, they turn, on, turn off the security cameras, and they put on the hide-and-seek song, which I absolutely love. They did an incredible job making the whole thing, like, it's, it sounds like something that was, it, you know, I, I, how old is it supposed to be? I guess it's supposed to be from, like, the 30s or something. Just, yeah. And she does take her heels off, which, you know, yeah, not gonna... You're going to struggle to run in those things. And, you know, Tony is the patriarch, so he's the one handing out the weapons. They don't get to pick the ones that they just... And, and Helen is just like, yes, you know, this is... You know, it's been 30 years and I'm back, baby. I am ready to fucking chop someone. And she does, you know, she doesn't... She, she isn't able to, to kill Grace herself, but she does use the axe to finish off one of the maids, you know. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and you know, turns out, you know, Alex, they, they were kind of expecting Al Alex is just going to sit in the room. And, you know, he's not crazy about this whole thing. He's been away from us for two years. Whatever, we'll just let him, you know. But he left, and... I forget, I th is it maybe Chastity who realizes, and she's like, fuck, 
<laughs> she knows this is bad news. This is not good for them. Let's see. And yeah, Fitch is really annoyed because of the, the crossbow. And the... Yeah, yeah. You know, he's like, can I can I have something from this century? I, I forget if that's when, but one of them says that. And he's like, how much time does this usually take? You know, and Grace is also like, okay, how much time is this going to take? You know, because she's like, I, you know, there are, there are several things she's interested in spending her wedding night on. Hide and seek for six fucking hours is not one of them. You know, she, she was hoping some boning... They're probably going to get some sleep, but hiding from, you know, but yeah, Fitch is not annoyed. He's not bothered by the fact that he has to kill Grace. He's just like, I mean, I have an appointment, you know, just, yeah. Let's see. And yeah, Alex hides Grace and she hears, you know, the, 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 um, yeah, she hears the rules because of the, um, yeah, uh, Emily accidentally kills one of the the staff, and just yeah, it's it's incredibly funny. It's just the, um, the uh, yeah yeah she accidentally she, you know she's like I found her and shoots, and it's like yes and oh shit um guys I I think I fucking shot our maid you know just and and the you know they 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 do uh, they flip a coin over who who takes which. Um, you know, if you if you pick up the head or the the legs, and they're dragging her, and you see like the there's a trail of blood after because she was shot in the face, you know, and and one of them is like I, I think it might be Becky who's like Emily, why did you shoot her in the head? We're supposed to keep her alive for the sacrifice, you know, just wow. And you know, Emily forgets the gun. She's like, oh, I'm just. I just gotta go pick up the gun and, you know, gets out some, some coke and, you know, and there's a trail of coke across, like, a, a milk mustache, a coke mustache. It's just so funny. Um, let's see. And, yeah, you know, Grace confronts Alex about the, the, let's, yeah, and, you know, and he's making excuses and she points out we could have eloped. Let's see, and yeah, he does try to get Grace out, and she starts ripping off parts of the dress. I do quite like that, you know, by the end, the, you know, a lot of the dress is gone, and there's a lot of blood on, like, when the cop is like, Jesus, what happened to you there at the end? I, you know, part of me wanted her to say, most of the blood's not mine, though, but her, her you know, in-laws, that was even funnier. And, yeah, uh, Daniel, the, let's see, um, oh, what did I write? Eh. It, yeah, yeah, Daniel loses, uh, loses Grace, I don't remember that, but anyway, yeah, you know, the, the, um, let's see. Yeah, Chastity is, like, telling Daniel, come on, get in the game, you know. this, And, yeah, several of the, the family members are like, Claire is dead, but she was my favorite. You know, they're not like, oh my god, what the fuck are we doing? We're killing people. This is unacceptable. No, they're just like, aw, we're gonna have trouble replacing that maid. She was so good. You know, just, the, it, look, I mean... They sound like they they accidentally drop like yeah like they accidentally dropped their phone on on concrete or something. It's like oh I'm gonna have to get myself a new phone. I like that phone. You know no it's it's a human being and they're they're just they don't care. And and you know you do see that in real you know remember when there was that fire in this. I I don't think it was in America but it was an American company in a different country. And, you know, there was a fire in, like, a factory or something, and people burnt to death, which is one of the most horrifying ways to go. Like, I guess if you're extremely lucky, maybe it's the smoke inhalation and you, you choke from that. But, like, I've been unfortunate enough that I've burnt 
you know, someone tricked me and burnt me. Uh, long story. The, the, uh, you know, school sucks. What can I say? The, the, uh, it wasn't a teacher. It was a student. But yeah, the, the, um, you know, and the teachers did give them a hard time. Uh, but, but yeah, the, the, um, you know, it hurts like a motherfucker to burn. Uh, you know, it's a, it's extremely painful. And, you know, Fox News were like, I mean, I'm sure they were really grateful that they had those jobs. Instead of being like, holy fucking shit, the, the political, you know, the, the people we're defending are letting people burn to death. Because, like, even if you want to say, oh, I mean, they didn't know there was going to be a fire. No, but they knew it was an option. That's why there's usually a fire escape. So you can escape the fire. That's because it has happened that there was, you know... Like, the fact that fire escapes are common in buildings today, you know, un yeah, un unless you're unfortunate in, in, you know, yeah, some people don't, aren't lucky enough to, to live in, you know, and yeah, because of money, because it's, it's cheaper to not have it there if you don't care about people dying. But the reason they exist is because there was a time where they didn't. And yeah, people sometimes died when there was a fire in a building. And then someone was like, Let's try not to make that happen again. So the moment that you say, let's not have a fire escape, you are implicitly agreeing that it's okay if some of the people in that building die, as long as you can save a little bit of money. And, you know, to be fair, sometimes it's a lot of money, but, you know, certainly if, if it's because, like, you, you know, you run a small business and you can't afford, okay, I think the, the government should give you enough money to you know, for those kinds of safety things. And it's fucked up if the, you know, I know some places don't require that. And and Helen finish off, finishes off the help because she keeps trying to finish her thought and there keeps being, like, gurgling and it's just, yeah. And, yeah, they, they bicker over how to play, you know, the, the so, so that they can, the, yeah, they don't bicker out over whether or not they should kill Grace. Let's see. And... Yeah, and, and Grace hides in the kitchen, and she's got the gun, but it's not loaded. So she puts in the... The... Um, the um, ah, what's it called? Yeah, you know, for, first she has to open the gun so she can put in, and it's, it's such great tension, and, you know, he has to check, uh, okay, there's nothing there, and, you know, off camera she moved to, to the other side of the, what's it called, the island, I think, um, and the, you know, she puts in the, and, and clicks, and get out, move, I'm afraid I can't do that. And she tries, you know, she's like, okay, I guess I, I have no choice. You know, it's my life or his. I gave him a choice. You know, and and click. The ammunition is display only. And just, oh my god, you know. And it, I love that because you could see how that could be it. Like that, you know, if she's got, she's got an ammo belt. She's got an elephant gun. Maybe the rest of the movie is her, like... Rambo, like, you know, they'll they'll be, like, going into a room and she'll, like, appear from somewhere and, you know, blow their fucking heads off or something. You know, that's... Yeah, that's a that's an extremely effective, you know... Yeah. If you play Nocturne, there are certain enemies that you can't kill without an elephant gun. Um, yeah, the, the uh, just... And, and, yeah, turns out it's, it's useless. It's not, yeah. And, yeah, the, the, let's see. Yeah, really great fight between Steven, Stevens and Grace in the kitchen. That was really great. And, let's see, the, yeah, and, and there's the, you know, the, the yeah, the, the last maid hid in the, uh, the oh right yeah yeah i gotta briefly say i really loved when like emily is you know she she's like 
I can't I can't use this gun and then like Fitch is like okay crossbow you know and and she accidentally cross you know sends an arrow into the mouth of the the second maid you know and they're like why did you shoot the maid and she's like I don't know what I'm doing <laughs> That really cracked me up. That was incredibly funny. Like, oh my god, just... <laughs> but, but yeah, and then the the last maid, who's not even really a maid, it's just Tony likes to see her dance, you know. She's she's trying to hide in the dumbwaiter, but she does scream for, for Grace, and, you know, accidentally the button gets pressed, and she has a very gnarly death getting crushed and blood pouring out her mouth. And... Let's see. So, so yeah, you know, Alex managed to open, you know, we saw him open one door, but or actually, yeah, I guess, no, it's like a security system. I guess it's probably universe, I don't know, I don't know, but, but yeah, you know, all of them are now electronically unlocked and, you know, Stevens is like, I, I can't, I, I tried, but I can't fix the security system as it is. Unfortunately, that means that the doors and windows remain unlocked. And, yeah, that's great escalation, because up to this point, there was no way for her to get outside. How could she get outside? Everything is locked, you know, but no, Alex managed to... So, so for the last portion of it, you know, and she does manage to get outside. It was also, it was really funny when, like, I forget... Uh, I, I forget the exact details, but, like, Grace... Like, she, she, you know, Alex told her, okay, you go down there and then, you know, open... That and that door, and then she get yeah. I think there's two doors, and you know she opens one, and she like steps all the way into, and you know oh, Daniel and Tony are carrying Clara, you know, and and then Emily shows up, and you know so just and that was also like she is an impressively bad shot, like I yeah all the coke and all the pills that you know she's so she's just shooting all over the place. And then one of the others is just like, you're supposed to shoot in the center of gravity, you know, like, like it's normal, like, like she's struggling with her car keys or something, you know, just, no, no, you, you press the, you press the part that goes, th there you go, there you go, now the door's unlocked, now we can move on, you know, let's, you know, no, she's, it's, it's a fucking gun and she's shooting people and just, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, and we find out that Helen killed her groom 30 years ago, and yeah, you know, the, the through that, the movie asks, well, what if, you know, was some, yeah, some, some of them are willing to kill uh, the, the, you know, even their own partner to be, and that's, you know, they're completely fine with that because it maintains the wealth, and you know, it, it reminded me of some of the people who join, you know, some, some of the people who tried to marry, or yeah, some of the people who married into the British royal family and the way that they were treated, you know. Now, let's, and, and, you know, Diana did end up dead very young. Like, I don't know if, uh, you know, I, I think I heard that it's basically, it's only really a conspiracy theory that it was like, murder but certainly it was avoidable you know if the if the paparazzi hadn't hounded her like that there wouldn't have been the the car accident but anyway um let's see yeah i love that fitch you know first he googles or he goes to youtube to find a, a you know crossbowing for dummies video and then he's like i know it's not google but yeah you know he's like google um are satanic pacts real or bullshit? Just, you know... Because, cause, I mean... I don't know. Is this really necessary, you guys? I I just don't know. Let's, let's you know... And, you know, uh, little little Georgie, who we heard earlier, had left... You know, the uh, Clara, I think it was, realized, oh, he's, you know, he left the, the room. He, he wasn't asleep in the, you know... And then, you know, she goes she, she um, goes into a room that Grace is hiding, and then she ends up shot. And then, yeah, Georgie hid in, the, you know, near the, near the goats, who are apparently also being sacrificed to the devil. Um, and then the, yeah, uh, um, Grace is like, oh, you know, it's just a little boy. And he fucking shoots her hand, and she socks him and, and punches, you know, knocks him out, which was just, yeah... 
and she falls backwards into the pit full of dead goats and oh yeah there's also the the skeleton of a human being you know just yeah and and you know later that is where they dump the the bodies of the maids so just yeah and the camera makes sure to show us the nail sticking out and it's like oh it's at the side then uh, let's see what was it i think it was her was it her left hand that got shot so it's it's her left side so she gradually climbs up and and just oh my god no let's so go oh god oh god you know removes the nail from just oh my god yeah she she really like the things she can do with her with her screams that you know some of it is like screams of fear right i i did copy that in i'll, I'll be talking about it later but yeah her screams holy shit and yeah i i like that there are really not a huge amount of parts in this movie that are like tense because we know something and you know some sometimes the character also knows it but sometimes not you know we have the we have the nail we have the the kitchen where she has to try to make as little noise as possible but load the gun uh, I guess is that um there's there's uh when she when she and Alex hides in that one bedroom I think that might be the only ones uh you know the rest of the time we don't know like she's she's through the door before we realize that Daniel and Tony are right there carrying one of the, carrying Clara you know and and certainly we didn't know that Emily was that close uh, you know, I, th I think it would have been exhausting if there were, like, non-stop of those, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that, that Hitchcock would do frequently and really well, and his movies didn't move anywhere near as fast as modern ones do, don't get me wrong, big fan of Hitchcock, though he definitely did some fucked up things also, that's a big fan of his movies, not of him as a person, there we go. And, and and also you know we don't get used to we're not sitting there thinking okay now there's gonna be another one because there's so few of these and they're decently enough spread out and becky misses and she's like in my defense it's been a while <laughs> oh my god you know she's not like i know you don't want us to kill you but no she's just like ah fuck i missed and let's see uh what is that oh right right yeah when she when the oh right sorry that was the other one when the crossbow misses you know that was also fine like i, th I think it was it's chastity she's taking it and it just flies way over and it's like well fuck yeah just yeah and and yeah the the gate like you know, at first it's like just a, a tiny little scrape, but she keeps, you know, she keeps fighting through the gate, so she ends up with like a long ass wound, and it's not just like oh, you know, tiny little scrape. No, 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 f there's fucking blood, you know, starting to pour out of that fucking thing. Just and I really like her rage at the the car that drives off was extremely cathartic. Um, just you know, she's like. She barely makes it through the, the gate. I also really like later when Steven is like, I'll fix the fence tomorrow. Just, wow, priorities, people. Uh, you know, he does say, I'll, I'll, I'll catch her and I'll fix the fence. Or, or I have caught her, I'll fix the fence. Something like that, but yeah. And the, you know, the car, like, it looks like, oh, it's actually, she's gonna, and again, think about how many movies that would have been the thing. Like, oh, okay, okay. Phew, fuck me. Okay, okay. It's okay. She gets in the car, they drive far the fuck away from there, and, you know, maybe, like, maybe the rest of the movie is, like, the, the cops come and, and arrest. But it looks like she's safe, you know, because that was the thing. If she gets off the, the mansion grounds, we're good, you know, that's all, you know. So, because certainly that seems much more realistic than her surviving between midnight and dawn, you know, but, but yeah, you know, the, and the car's like, get off the road, and it's like, 
what the fuck, you know, and she, she screams and, and cusses, and, and finally she says, fucking rich people. <laughs> but yeah, that was, that was really, really cathartic, like, that's, yeah. And, yeah, um, I may have already said, but I thought it was really funny how the family and even couples argue a lot during this whole, yeah. And really gnarly when the, the dead bodies of the maids are dropped into the goat pit and we just hear, oh, wow, that was definitely some, bro some, some broken bones there. And let's see. Yeah, and, and Grace versus Stevens. You know, first he, he you know, he gets really close to her in the car and that was also like I was like holy shit he's gonna he's gonna fucking run her over and you know the yeah the fight between them and like her eyes are like that of an animal she's not like this you know scared little shrinking violet no, no she's like you know I'm gonna fucking kill this guy and let's see um right yeah the the you know she she gets the the car and she presses the the thing and i don't even i guess it's like on star maybe i've never even heard of the the thing but yeah you know so your know, first automatic voice please rem you know please remain on the line while we you know until there's someone ready to to help you you know and then you know Hi, my name is Justin. I'm here to... How, how can I help you tonight? And she's like, they're trying to fucking kill me! Okay, okay. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call the police, okay? Um, Grace, I'm sorry, but that car has been reported stolen. Um, I have to shut it down. It's company policy. My hands are tied. And, and she's like, what the fuck is you? And he's like, oh, please, there's no need to be profane you know just holy fucking shit these people and their fucking priorities oh my god and then you know, <laughs> and he's like so grace is there anything else i can you know and, and there's also like so please know we are recording this so that we can better help you know just shut the fuck up here's what is happening you know and and it's like so grace is there anything else i can help you with tonight Go fuck yourself! Okay. Goodbye, you know, and still... <laughs> and, and this was apparently um, Nat Faxon just... Dude, perfect job. Like, holy shit. Like, everyone knows the tone of one of these. Like, because he's... Like, you know, okay, I have to stay calm because otherwise my boss will be... You know, will will yell at me even though I didn't do anything wrong. You know, it would be understandable if he was like, "Holy fucking shit, are you are are you gonna be okay?" You know, but no, he has to stay this calm and then you know, company policy and this whole thing just yeah, like oh my god, his reaction to her swearing was so funny. Oh my god, like just yeah, like there's there's really no need for profanity here. And let's see. Yeah, yeah. And and Stevens, you know, manages to to knock her out with a dart because the car is immobile. Just let's see. And you know, she first she has a, a dream that it's Alex, and then it turns into a nightmare. And she manages to kick Stevens, and they have a fight, and there's a car crash, and just the whole like. And he calls. You know, he's like, so, Mr. LaDomas, I, I got her going home. I'll fix the fence tomorrow. You know, and, and he's like playing Tchaikovsky really loud. It's like, ah, best song ever, you know, and, and the, the other, you know, he's got the, the, ah, uh, there, there, it's like a video call or whatever, you know, and, and they're like, she's behind you. She's, you know. She's behind you, because it's a slasher movie. You know, it's, it's it's there are elements of a slasher movie in it. No, there's someone on the back seat, and they're gonna hurt you. Yeah, but it's she's been attacked so many times. You know, just love that little twist, little subversion of of expectations. You know, and just and they're like, you mother, you idiot, stop playing the music so loud. You can't hear what we're saying. <laughs> 
Let's see. And yeah, the the let's see. Uh, 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 yeah, Alex and and Becky talk. Right, right. Uh, Daniel tries to reason with the others, and uh, Alex and Becky talk. You know. Yeah, Alex talks about you know. Oh yeah, sl slaughtering goats and to the sacrifice and you know. I thought it was normal, and he points out family can make you do anything, which I think is, you know, that's when he makes the decision that he is going to help them. He's going to st stop trying to help her, and yeah, you know, I I don't think she would have thrown back the ring there at the end, if not for the the you know, an argument could be made that it would be fair for her to, but I don't. I think the the choice was when she, you know. When he turned on her. Instead of turning her on. Since we do know they apparently lived in sin for a while. But yeah. Um, let's see. But but yeah. You know. Family can make you do anything. And yeah. I mean. That reminds me. You know. I was recently reminded that Lady Diana was shocked. To, I, I forget who. I, I can't keep all the, the royal family straight. And I honestly don't give a fuck that I can't. But yeah. She was shocked when she found that her partner was okay with fox hunting because, you know, if you don't, if you have some empathy, if you, you know, it's, it's barbaric. It's like, it's not okay. It's not like, I mean, I guess you could make an argument about like, okay, tell you what, if you can use a bow and arrow to one shot kill like a deer uh, I, I, if I recall, deer aren't, like, in, um, ah, what, what's it called? They're not endangered, an endangered species, you know. If you can do that, and you go out of your way to use all of it, you know, eat the meat, uh, I don't know if you're allowed to wear the fur, but, like, use all of it. You know what? I can understand an argument. I, I still don't think you should do it. But I could, I could at least understand. But if you aren't that, fuck you. Don't hunt. And certainly not, like, fucking fox hunting. It's basically, you know, you're, you're basically just torturing the foxes to death. That's, that's what's happening, you know. And, yeah, you know, a bunch of rich people, all, you know, think, no, it's, it's fun. It's fun to torture living things to death. Because, I mean... People before me did it. So why... I'm supposed to have empathy when people before me did stupid, hateful shit? That doesn't make any sense to rich people. And... Let's see... You know, yeah. The family and press were okay with destroying her to defend the royal family. And, I mean, even though the the... The UK was run by a democracy long before she married into the family, and they're still obsessed with protecting the family. Like, don't get me wrong, like, I can understand if, if you have a very uh, frail situation with the government, you know, I, I, you know, you still shouldn't do it, but, but no, there was nothing. It was just ego. Ego and wealth. And turns out Daniel poisoned the others with a hydrochloric acid. And it's, you know, and he frees Grace. And it's such a great, because, like, you know, he's like, well, yeah, I, I gave them what we pour on the, you know, because, yeah, that's, that's, that's how they get rid of the bodies, hydrochloric acid, you know. And, and Tony, you know, yeah. Tony has a fairly appropriate reaction, I'll, I'll admit. You know, at, th at that point, it is, like, it makes sense that he's, like, really pissed off. But, you know, he said, no, 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 uh, um, I googled it. It's okay. I, I just gave them a, a tiny little bit. They'll shit weird for a week, but they'll live, you know. That... <laughs> and, let's see. Um, yeah, and, and Chastity wants to shoot Grace and she's okay with shooting Daniel to, to get, you know, and there's a fight between Chastity and Grace. And, and yeah, like, you know, she's willing to kill her own husband if it protects her. And the, the, 
yeah, I really appreciate, you know, Daniel's flaky over the course of the movie, but here, he is unwavering, like, he is, no, if you want to shoot her, you gotta go through, oh, fuck, you were okay with going through me, you know, he, he covers Grace, although, you know, what was, was it Becky who said, she's, she's a tiny blonde twig, you know, he, he is bigger than her, but nevertheless, you know, there's no, he doesn't stand next to her, he stands in front of her, between her and Chastity. And Tony, you know, ref I, I, yeah, I think he says something like, about, you know, Grace, she's a, she's a goat, or that goat, or like a goat, or something like that. And I don't think he means greatest of all time. And Becky versus Grace with the box as a weapon, I quite liked... And that's also, you know, yeah, she she is, you know, Becky is undone by the symbol of of the this fucked up tradition, you know, and as someone who has worked on one horror movie, horror short, I appreciate the detail that after she, you know, or and yeah, even as she's beating, you know, because because you know, based on we we don't see the box hit. The, the face, but, like, that must... Is it face? Maybe it's back of the skull. Anyway, it's in the head. 100% certain. We, certain. we can tell. And over the course of it, more and more blood on the box, and a little bit of hair. So, that's... Yeah, because that, that was also something that someone, you know, that was working on the, the horror short that I worked on... They insisted, no, 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 it's it's especially gnarly. And, you know, at first I was like, what? why is hair... Oh, right, because that means that, that, that it's substantial damage. to. The... Yeah, I guess it almost must be... It, it certainly, it can't have been the face then. It must have been the, the upper head. But, but yeah, you know, that's a, that's a great... And... <laughs> Fuck your fucking family! <laughs> Let's see, and... Um, yeah, and, and then afterwards, you know, at first, Grace isn't even letting Alex touch her. And this is before he betrays, uh, or, yeah, before the final betrayal he does, you know. And, you know, it, in, in real life, I'm not sure there are that many rich people who believe that Satan is helping them, but certainly some think that God is helping them, and because of that, it's okay. You know, well, I forget the name, but there's a... There's a uh, televangelist who said that he shouldn't have to fly with, you know, he, he should have a private, he should have multiple private jets because if you fly commercial, there are all these demons. So I guess his own voters, his own, uh, not voters, <laughs> although he has more power than certain politicians do, his own constituents are demons. If they aren't giving him money so he can fly private jets, they are demons. That's, like, yeah. Disgusting. Beyond disgusting. Um, yeah, and then the, um, yeah, Dawn, and they're like, oh my god, oh my god, you know, and, and then I love that there's, like, maybe 30 seconds or so where it's like, oh, fuck. I guess we all. I guess we did all this for nothing. There's, there's not actually, a, you know, we're not actually gonna die because of, you know. And then, oh fuck, you know. I, th I think, and I think Helen is the first to explode, but she does realize it before it happens. So just, you know, she she has time to realize. Oh, this motherfucking blonde twig, fucked us all. God damn it. And the yeah, you know. All of the the um, different, yeah, all of them end up exploding. And I do understand, like, two of the people who explode into blood are the little boys. You know, Georgie and Gabe Bradley. And, yeah, I can understand why, you know, the, the yeah. Some people feel that's crossing a line. And I did notice we didn't see them explode. You know, we saw Helen explode. And, and Fitch, and I think also 
Em no, wait, actually, is Emily the one who's trying to run away with the... Yeah, but, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I feel like, the, you know, the movie's taking a stand. The, the even rich, you know, children are, you know, and I don't think that the idea is supposed to be that they were born evil, but they were corrupted by family, like Alex, you know, and yeah, I mean, if, if Alex can't, you know, he's been away from the family for two years. He he's known Grace for a year and a half at this point, and uh, yeah, the the um, that's not enough. That's not enough to make him n leave them and not be willing to kill his own spouse. Yeah, I I don't think that. But but I 100% I I acknowledge, you know, some people feel that it is unacceptable. Obviously it's unacceptable in real life. Some people feel it's also unacceptable in a in in fiction to kill children. And I understand why. I'm not I I'm not going to get into that that argument here, but I just I'm I'm saying I see why the movie is doing it. And and for sure like I 100% understand people who don't think it's okay. Like, I know a lot of people that I m could show this movie to that would be 100% on board with everything other than the, the kids dying. And let's see. Right, right. And yeah, before Helen dies, she still wants to kill Grace. She knows that it, nothing is going to... She thinks at this point nothing's going to happen. But she's still like, I'm going to fucking murder... Just, yeah... And let's see. Yeah, and we hear the the tune again, but now it's really t twisted. You know, the the hide and seek song, and some of them explode onto Grace, like blood in her hair and on her face. And she's standing there like laughing. And just yeah, that was wow. And she gives Alex his ring back, and he blows up. And uh. I can't tell what that blows up. Uh, yeah, I can't tell what that note means. Anyway, and then, um, yeah, you know, what happened? In-laws, you know, and she's sitting there, she's smoking using Becky's fancy cigarette holder, you know, uh, not holder, the cigarette box. I don't, I don't smoke, I don't know what the nomenclature is and um yeah you know the the cops arrive and i love that the shot is focused on her and we see the fire in the background she like slowly grabs the smoke and you know we hear yeah you know, and the cop is like holy shit uh oh fuck okay um i'm gonna need medical evacuation please okay um uh are you okay what what uh um uh, what happened to you? You know, he's he's fucking panic. You know, or not 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 panicking. He not not like out of control. That is actually yeah. Um, despite the whole class struggle thing, it's not actually against cops. It thinks that cops would help a poor person. Although it's possible that he thinks that she's one of the rich pun ones. But you know, I I just can't help but notice that, you know. There are other movies that are about class struggle that acknowledge that the cops. Are there to protect rich people they are not here to fight for the rest of us and I'm not certain I, I guess I could uh, briefly look let's see so it would be uh, what's it called soundtracks I guess uh, so that uh, yes love me tender the the it is performed by Chuck Jackson apparently and I gotta say great cover um, and I'm really glad that, like, the Elvis version is amazing. Don't get me wrong. I really don't think the Elvis version would have fit here. So I'm really glad that they went with, uh, you know, and may maybe it was also a money thing. But I think that it was the right choice for song and cover. I, I It's such a great, ironic, you know, it's like, isn't love sweet as she sits there, like, covered in blood including the blood of her now ex-husband you know like it's it's so so ironic and just yeah absolutely love that um i think that is oh right right oh i just have to briefly say 
Um, I saw one user review who said that, you know, they, they expressed they didn't like that it was a cover. And one of the things they said was, that definitely wasn't Elvis. I mean, you pass your hearing test. I don't. I don't know what else to say to that. That's that's like, holy shit, dude. We know. We can tell. Elvis has a very distinct vo had a very distinct voice. That's not Elvis. That's true. That's yeah. Um, let's see. That brings us to the final section. Holy shit. That's. I did not expect this video to get quite this long. Anyway, um, final section. Notes taken before watching. So apparently Adam Brody has to play a character who attempts to kill for Satan every 10 years now. I'm down for that. I hope that he plays every single one of them with Guyliner and Manscara. So a lot of movies about class warfare point out the sadism and cruelty common to rich people. Perhaps particularly old money. And this, you know, this does that. But this is one of the movies that also get that they are also very frequently completely incompetent like in this movie they're bad at cornering and killing this one person like don't get me wrong i'm not i didn't want them to kill grace but holy shit they are they are so bad at this you know in real life countless rich people fail upwards some for their entire lives like donald trump who was the sitting president when this was produced and released i do not think that is an accident like they they didn't put a direct like no one in this is just Trump, you know, and I don't think it would have worked as well. Although, let's see, Helen has the hair, Emily is as useless, and let's be honest, there's some drug use going on. There's no, nobody sounds like that if they're not, like, I, um, I forget, I think it's like Adderall that he's, he's, like, yeah. Um, Tony is as evil. Let's see... Uh, Stevens is as liable to miss something important because he's obsessing about a piece of media, although in the movie it's a song rather than, you know... Because I, I don't think it should be forgotten that Donald Trump, one of the reasons... I forget, is it was it two or was it three? I feel like I heard that it was... I'm sorry, I'm googling Donald Trump, and one of the things that came up was Donald Trump toilet brush? Yeah, that looks, yeah. Um, it's, it's his giant orange hair, that's the brush itself, so you can stick him in your toilet. Oh. 89 Danish crowns, what's that? That's like, uh, 13 bucks? I'm not in the market for one, but maybe next time. Anyway, uh, Donald Trump casinos. He managed to... Uh, let's see. Um, here we go. Okay, how he bankrupted his casinos, but still... Oh, fuck. It's, uh, it's not a free article, evidently. Um... Okay, so here we go. How many casinos did Donald Trump bankrupt? Holy shit. Okay, okay, not all of these are casinos. Okay, so there's the Trump Castle, Trump Taj Mahal, Trump Plaza Casino. Um, okay, I'm struggling to find... Anyway, I feel like I... Certainly he built at least two that started cannibalizing each other. And apparently the reason that he really wanted, because people were trying to talk him out of it, and the reason he insisted on building multiple casinos close to each other, because everybody knows, everybody who knows anything about casinos knows, if you build multiple close to each other, they will cannibalize each other. The reason that he insisted was he liked to be standing up in the window and look out the window and see his name multiple times. Like a fucking child, like a like a four-year-old. And he became president, and it's not completely impossible that he might become again next year. Although, thankfully, you know, he got, yeah.
like, I don't, I don't think very many people wanted Biden to be president. But enough people did not want Trump to get another term. So, uh, let's see. Right, right. In the comment section for one review of this, someone who is clearly not themselves rich, but simping for rich people, said that there are good rich people and evil poor people, as well as evil rich people and good poor people. First off, while I do not personally believe that it is possible to be genetically evil, you know, it, it's evil is a choice either... Uh, it is possible for some people to make others evil, but once those people come of age and once they have the internet, they have a choice of whether to start doing good or continue doing evil. But evil, you know, anyone born into wealth who choose to hold on to the wealth rather than spend it to help the less fortunate are choosing evil. It's that simple. And anyone who becomes rich in their own lifetime without being born into wealth has taken advantage of people in order to amass wealth. It is literally impossible to earn so much money that you end up wealthy. You must have taken advantage of other people. And... I'm just going to make sure I save that in case I want it for a later video as well. Uh, while it is, of course, possible to be poor and evil, the two are not mutually exclusive. Mutually exclusive. Poor people who are evil are unable to hurt anywhere near as many people as rich people do. As such, it is important to fight rich people more so than evil poor people. And right now, there's too much focus on poor people who do evil. Like... A lot of, like, don't get me wrong, if you go out there and kill someone, I definitely want you to be prevented from killing anyone else, although I think, you know, largely it makes more sense to go for the, ah, uh, hold on, not, re, uh, not, not the, um, yeah, not retribution, but deterrence and restoration. You know, and as far as the, the types of punishment go, a lot of people who, who kill are poor. And it's, you know, yeah, you know, the, the, and that's evil, for sure. The violence is only ever acceptable if it is to prevent greater violence. But the... There's too much focus in the media on people who kill someone. You know, it, it's important to note when it's political. It's, it's important to note, you know, sometimes someone poor kills someone out of misogyny or racism or that kind of thing. Um, but there's way too much focus on, you know, you have a lot of mainstream media... Def who, who'd rather like they're they're fine with defending rich people who hurt people but if a poor person like does something you know then immediately they will jump on that and say ah see it's good that we have rich people because look at what poor people do when we abuse them until the yeah anyway so uh right the movie ultimately Grace does not intentionally hurt very many of them. She mostly outlasts the... If someone would make, like, a DLC for Outlast, where you play as Samara, as, as Grace, like, I mean, you know, you wouldn't be, you wouldn't see her since it's first person, but you could have her, you know... Every so often she could have, like, a line. Although I, I would understand if Samara, Samara Weaving herself doesn't want to voice the, the video game. Although, actually, yeah, could someone make, like, an unofficial thing and, like, just take her lines from this movie? Like, because cause honestly, like... And, and, you know, instead of having it be, you know, these the, uh, variants, I think they're called? in the, It's been years, sadly. Uh, I'd like to play it soon again, but yeah, um, back pain. The, the, yeah, you know, instead of the, the variants, it, the, you could make it the Domas family, 
and every so often one of them would really fuck up and that would buy you a little bit of time and yeah you know when like certainly when when she you know you could have a part where she's like trying to get the attention of a car and it just drives past and she goes fucking rich people anyway ultimately grace outlasts them and then they get killed by the demon and, you know, an argument could be made that the message is that the 99% just have to outlast the rich. We're not meant to get violent with them. And I've just stated my position on real-life violence. Um, I don't... Because uh, it is necessary to fight them. But she does also fight some. Um, yeah, you know, the thing is, ultimately, it is... Um, it is difficult with this sort of movie to get, like, it's. it would be great if the movie also conveyed, here's what we should do. You know, here's the, the um, you know, the, the thing that, you know, because some of these movies do manage to present an alternative and, and even show the alternative to be uh, uh, successful in, you know, so... Um, I guess, uh, I mean, yeah, certainly, you know, something like the movie Fresh, and I'm not going to be spoiling it, but there is a very clear, like, it shows that women can help protect other women. And, you know, it's, it's making the case that that's something that's necessary in order to to win, and I'm not going to say what the evil is, you know, in, in this video, since I don't want to spoil that movie, but, yeah, you know, and, and ultimately, you know, th this movie doesn't really have an alternative, although I do think it is meaningful that Grace chooses not to, you know, she, she gives the, the ring back to Alex, and it's only then that he blows up, you know, so, yeah. And, let's see, yeah, you know, um, even Alex betrays Grace, and, let's see, yeah, like the other recently released progressive films, the lead is a woman who comes to realize the importance of controlling the narrative in order to come out on top in her situation dealing with a man who hurts women. And I think it is worth noting that Alex does appear to love Grace, and Becky appreciates that Alex is back with the family, but they still, you know, somewhat go along with the sacrifice of grace. At the end of the day, they want money more than love. And if you come in from the outside, you will never truly be one of them. Like, you can... The... the yeah, you know, the, the way that they're not even, like... They, they don't even particularly like each other. They just like the money, you know? Um, and... Let's see... Yeah, uh, right. So, some critic quotes. I'm one of the 99% and I don't hate the rich, so you're uninformed is what you're saying. And then he continues to write, You get to make a living off of writing about movies. What's better than that? Healthcare. And Weaving is a monster talent with the ability to handily embody the part of bewildered prey, competent action hero, and frustrated head out to hear slapstick comedy straight woman in the same movie and effectively carry the tone of the whole thing. Absolutely true. Uh, while it is ultimately a horror movie, it's best when it leads into black comedy. A few surprising twists in the final 15 minutes help differentiate it from the 9,000 or so other thrillers about pretty women covered in blood running for their lives. Let's see. And yeah, um, so I acknowledge that this is this is definitely this is valid. It's just it's not how I feel, but it's valid. I found it too repetitive that they keep finding her and then she escapes. And then they go on to say, I also really wanted a flashback or two to other games played with brides, since some of the people in the movie married into the family. I don't necessarily think that would have been bad but i think it would have been distracting the one flashback there is is important because it tells us how alex and daniel feel about this and why and let's 
Let's see. The allegory doesn't really work as anti-capitalism, but straightforward forward class bigotry, given that the original short story was written in 1924 for Collier's Magazine for middle and working class readers. Yeah, uh, I haven't mentioned it yet, but the original, you know, this is certainly in partially inspired by the, uh, uh, the, f fuck, what's it called? The Most Dangerous Game, I think it is. Yes, the, the original short story is The Most Dangerous Game. 1924 was really a satire about the passion of the day for safari hunting by well-off trust fund Americans. A real satire of capitalism would focus on organized greed, even better now thanks to social media, globalization, and powerful algorithms, versus disorganized democracy with fewer resources and skills. The Wolf of Wall Street and American Psycho would be a couple of good examples. Starship Troopers is probably one of the best satires I've ever seen on economics and militarism, and I went over the head of every single movie critic in the country at the time, including this site and yeah it's it's true yeah yeah me honestly maybe the reason that this isn't as focused on that is that they were worried that people would misunderstand like it's wild like you're you're allowed to not like starship troopers like i'm i'm not going to claim that it's a completely perfect movie i love it but you know you're allowed to hate it but to say that it's not satire to say that it's in favor of fascism it's just, I I don't even know how you how you get there. Like, the first time I watched it, I was like thirteen, and I watched it with another thirteen year old. And you know, when we weren't watching masterpieces, we were watching fucking Jason X, and we still got it. Like, just holy shit! Some people have terrible media literacy. Anyway, um, yeah, Wolf of Wall Street, American Psycho, Starship Troopers. Yes, uh, it's it, I agree. It is more class class warfare than you know it's it's not really capitalism as a a whole you know like grace hasn't been disadvantaged by capitalism itself you know she was she was a um an an orphan and like the uh what's it called like her um you know for, for sure like she would have had a better life if she were rich but you know she didn't she didn't have a family the the um, anyway let's see. yeah um let's see yeah uh, some people say you know oh the third act trades in the um the comedy for the supernatural is the third act not as funny yeah, maybe. I don't know. I, I thought it was fine. And really, you know, the supernatural is implied from the start of the film. It's just, we don't really know if it's for real. You know, they keep saying, yeah, but not really, right? Because, like, that's ridiculous, you know. Most of the worst violence is against women, perpetuating the, perpetuating the idea that bad things happening to women is somehow entertaining. That is sadly true. And that's, you know... As the movie is, you know, playing with the tropes of slasher movies, you know, one of the worst things about slasher movies is all the violence against women. So I wish that they had, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. One quibble, ready or not, makes far too much use of the convenient concussion when a character is knocked out from a bump to the head only to come to when the script calls for it later on. The scenario repeats at least five or six times. Wow. I must not have... Um, yeah, Par partially in order to keep its small pool of characters around for as long as possible. But this is one movie cliche that audiences just aren't buying anymore. Okay, I mean, let's see. So there's, there's when uh, when she's knocked out with the dart gun. Um, I guess George, being knocked out. Was Alex maybe knocked out once? I think he was knocked out at least once. And then comes to later, and then manages to free himself. Um... Oh yeah, yeah. The and the. Um... Okay, yeah, yeah. Maybe. I don't know. I, I. It didn't really bother me, and I actually read that quote before. So. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Uh, some people say, you know. 
Um, yeah. Um, and why, for that matter, does this family still put so much faith in this generation's old pact with the devil? Creepy Aunt Helen? I get it. Maybe even parents Tony and Becky, who seem like nice enough folks but might have lived with the tradition for too long. But Fitch and Emily, who have only recently married into the family themselves, seem a little too eager to get into the bloodshed to be believable, and so do the family's butler and their trio of young maids who are just working a job and have never previously experienced this deadly game, but are more than happy to help this deranged family hunt down Grace. Here's an answer from another critic. That is part of the power of the movie. Who believes that this absurd family story could possibly be true? But they have had to do this before, and they will do it again to protect family and fortune. And yeah, you know, sadly, I mean, you know, sometimes... Um, I don't know that I love the word class traitor. I've, I've heard too many people use it about rich people who actually try to help, like Bernie Sanders. You know, he has money, but he is trying to help people. He's not saying that they're, that tax, he's still fighting for higher taxes, even though it means that he would himself have to pay more in taxes because of how much money he has, you know, but... Sometimes there there is such a thing as poor people who are class traitors, you know, people who fight unions and yeah, in this case, yeah, the the fam, you know, the maids and the butler, you would think that they would prefer you know, other people who don't have a lot of money. You know, certainly the no one in the family thinks of them as completely human, you know, that they're 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 like tools for them that's it but they yeah um sadly some people identify so much with rich people simp for rich people you know right now we're seeing a lot of people simping for elon musk who's like okay some things he does well and i i wouldn't hate him which i do if he just stuck to the few things that he knows how to do well. But no, he keeps insisting on doing all these things that he has no idea how to do. And just, you know, calling a guy who's helping people a pedophile because Musk himself can't help in a situation where, like, nobody asked. Like, it's not like he's like, oh, but I was, you know, people said I, you know. Anyway. Yeah, a lot of people who aren't themselves rich simp for the rich and would rather support the rich than, yeah, you know, and, and the, the I, yeah, I think it's noteworthy that, like, at the end of the day, like, oh, I forget, did Stevens, I guess Stevens died in the car crash, but yeah, you know, so, so that is partially down to grace, but the others, like, you know, the two of the two of the maids were killed by the Ladomas family, and the last one, I f I'm not 100% certain who it was that accidentally pressed the button, but certainly Grace, like Grace, had to run, or she herself would would die. You know, she you could make an argument that she left the the dancer not really made to die, but she certainly didn't mean for her to die. You know, I, I do think it is noteworthy that they die because the family is, you know, incompetent and don't care enough about, you know, that is the thing. Like, countless poor people die because of rich people, you know, some of them don't care and would rather make money than take, than, than take safety precautions. Some of it, it's because they, you know, they're, they're just so... Like, think about how many people Trump let die because they weren't in his in-group. You know, when the when the big water, ocean water, very wet from the perspective of water. Ah, crap, I forget. Was it a turn, tornado, hurricane? I can never keep those straight. When that hit, you know, it was his responsibility. He was president, and he was like, no, there, I'm, I've done all I can. No, he fucking hadn't. Um, and deep down he knew, but he hates them. And he's fine with, I forget how many thousands of them died because he's a hateful piece of shit who's also incompetent and like, just, yeah. Um, let's see. I th yeah, so, so, uh, incompetence, hatred, 
just, yeah, you know, I, f I forget his name, but there was, you know, uh, Young Turks have that thing, um, I think it's called When Rich Men Cry. Uh, let's see, is, there was that, um, Leon Cooperman, who was on CNBC, and he whined and cried there's there's not really there's not something inherently wrong with the the wow lord of patriarchy is mocking tyt still crying about andrew tate yeah there's a fucking reason you sociopath jesus fucking christ anyway he was on CN Leon Cooperman on CNBC and like literally wealth tax it's the tiniest little thing it's nothing he wouldn't even if if it was passed and no one told him he wouldn't realize it that's not how money is for poor people if you don't have a lot of money you have to count every single little thing and in America like everyone who is trying to sell you a product or service like there's like like a good 75 percent of them are trying to scam them and then when they get scammed they can't get a proper lawyer and nothing you know happens like the only time rich the only time rich people pay is when they rip off other rich people and he goes on camera and he cries about having to pay like it's, it's just, it's insane. The money, the tiny amount, the, the, the percentages of his massive wealth, he's a billionaire, that he would be paying in taxes could save countless lives. And he goes on TV and cries because he measures his ego in dollars and cents and just, yeah. I think the wealth the, the wealth tax should go much, much further. And anyone who I I think if you if you're rich and you don't want the wealth tax, start by spending so much of your money on saving and helping poor people that you won't be affected by the wealth tax. And then we can talk. Then you're no longer a despicable human being, or at least not as much of one. So, that brings... Yes, so the... Um, yeah, so some, some critic quotes about Weaving. Weaving screeches, escape from a guttural pit of desperation and angst, her quivers when creeping throughout the Lodoma's mansion, engaging fear in its most primal state. Then the flip. Weaving's defensive combat as she demonstrates what makes any survivor girl worth watching. Death is not an option. Obstacles in her path made to feel the insurmountable pain she's endured. Weaving's firecracker attitude, reaction to being failed by weaker counterparts, and full immersion into the roughest, tumbliest roles stands unparalleled. May this be the nuclear breakout she deserves. I, I did want to very briefly comment on when, when Emily fails to, to hit her with the gun and, like... Grace just, you know, runs, ducks, and, and gets past without being hit. Because she actually did have to fend for herself when she was younger, you know, which... Actually, I forget, it. Emily... No, I don't think Emily married into the family, right? Because Emily's with Fitch. Fitch married into the family. But, but yeah, you know, Emily doesn't usually have to do anything with any degree of competency. So she's completely... She's fucking up nonstop. A st you know, and and I also I will say I would be really bothered by it if the um, ah what's it called if he was just constantly making women look bad but not men but the men also look really bad and I get that it's not you know it's not an even playing field sadly it's still worse when you make women look bad but yeah it you know for sure like. The, the most evil of them is Tony, and you know, the patriarch. Uh, let's see. There was one other thing. Uh, what was it? 
Um, right, yeah, that was what I, you know when I when I mentioned the the worst aspect, the fact that there's so much women uh, violence against women, you know the maids, and the the fact that the the um. Yeah, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that where I say, you know, like, it's it's kind of gross that, you know, it's, you know, we're supposed to laugh at the dark comedy of the these maids dying, and that's, yeah. Now, let's see. So yes, another critic quote, A star is born. If she hasn't already hasn't been already identified as one of the leading ladies in the horror genre, Samara Weaving just planted her flag to lay claim to being one of the great genre stars. We'll have to see how long she stays in the horror room, but as of now, with Mayhem the Babysitter and now Ready or Not in her portfolio, she may be the Jamie Lee Curtis of this era. Yeah. Should she decide to continue making horror movies, and she's gonna be in Scream 6, and I cannot fucking wait. I really enjoy her previous films... Let's see, uh, where she showed a natural charisma and conventionally good looks. In this feature, she ups her acting game, bringing the full arsenal of acting skills to the table. From romantic giddiness to revulsion through shock, frustration, and anger, she brings it all convincingly in this movie. Very true. And it just, yeah. Like, it's such... Like, if you want to have... A, like, if you want to see a huge... Because that's, uh, yeah, yeah, one of, uh, actually, yeah, not the ver first shot, but one of the first shots in this movie is her sitting there practicing the vows, and she's like, oh, I can't believe I'm going to get married. She's a little nervous also, but, you know, she's really looking forward to it. And then at the end, she's like smoking and uh, in-laws, you know, that was absolutely, yeah, I, I really appreciate when a movie can do, you know, let's see, uh, you know, it, it, it used to be just... Oh, the final girl, you know, eventually one of the ensemble will survive through the, you know, occasionally you could tell who the final girl is going to be, but in a lot of slasher movies and, and proto and sort of slasher movies, you can't really tell who the final girl is going to be until there's no one else left. But that also means that you can't have as much, uh, okay, Grace isn't given a lot of development, but there is a lot of focus on her. Now, uh, hit me up in the comments. Let me know what is your favorite movie like this. Do you think that, you know, it's good that they're doing Scream movies now? Do you hope they'll keep doing that or do you hope they'll go somewhere else? Honestly, I'd be pretty much down for anything. Any, I hope they keep making movies that have both, that, that are both horror and comedy or, or horror and satire. But, yeah. Uh, if they want to make something completely different, uh, yeah. Um, Devil's Do has a very low rating uh, on IMDb, Metacritic, and I believe also Rotten Tomatoes. So even though that one is on Disney+, Plus, I don't really intend to watch. I, I try not to, you know, I don't, I don't want to watch too many bad movies these days. It's just, I've spent so many years of, so many hours of my life over years of my life that, that yeah uh yeah do you have any rewrite suggestions do you think there's something in this movie that should have been done differently uh let me know and if you like this video please thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be a link to my main channel page one two more links to stuff like relevant playlists i suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now i put out Usually one vlog, this time it was two per week, reviewing and sharing spoiled thoughts on a movie, and recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. Once the, the you know, I also did for, for Willow, and I did for Star Wars and MCU, you know, I, I'm not 100% certain when it is, but at some point we will get more MCU, and, you know, I, yeah, and, and live action Star Wars I will also watch as soon as it premieres, Animated, I will watch as soon as I'm caught up on the old animated, but I am watching the Clone Wars now, um, partway through the first season, and once I've watched all of the ones that, you know, I'm not watching every single, uh, I'll really quickly go over, so it's, here we go, yeah. Uh, other than Clone Wars, I'm doing Rebels Resistance, Bad Batch, and Tales of the Jedi, 
and Young Jedi Adventures, I can imagine, probably. But currently, I do not plan on doing droids, Ewoks, or Visions. I'm sure Visions is amazing, but I don't think I have the chops to properly cre like critique anime. I, I simply don't think I have the, the chops for it. And I, I don't want to really, you know... They deserve proper analysis, and I don't think I can uh, t deliver that. And I did also do the animated micro-series, the, the Clone Wars. And I do also intend to do Forces of Destiny, but I am not currently planning on doing any of the other Wikipedia-listed animated micro-series and shorts for Star Wars. But yeah, um... In other words, uh, uh, and recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if you want more videos like this, you're in luck. You can check out my back catalogs with Catch My Way next week. I hope you enjoyed watching as I enjoyed watching and recording, and I will catch you next time.